target. Maximum firepower. Uh, first things first, welcome to the Brace for Impact podcast. I'm Luke. Today we're going to be discussing our matches from our previous local tournament. We're going to analyze some of the fleet building statistics from the 2022 International Team Championship. In our final segment, we'll be reviewing the recent Star Wars TV show, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead. Let's talk about our most recent uh, battle report. Take us away, Chandler. Well, not battle report, but local tournament. Oh, is that what's first? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so first Sorry. is yeah. the the local tournament. So this was it last Sunday. We did uh, a local tournament like we have been doing since. It end, was fantastic. The turnout yeah. wasn't quite as big as we normally have, but you know, after the Fourth of July weekend, I'm uh, you know not too surprised about that. Um, you know, something that definitely stood out to me from the last tournament is that we did have two of the double onager builds. Yeah, that that can be pretty demoralizing for some people when they when they see so many onagers i mean you say that yet i'm one of the contributors to the double onager yeah. situation um, i just think it I was mean, like so, I mean, unlucky like that that two people decided to bring double onagers at like the same time hmm. it's interesting right so um from the perspective of someone who who runs double onagers do you, is it do people really feel some type of way about it I think for sure that, that people feel some type really? of way about double onagers. But maybe not double onagers wow. specifically, but like a specific kind of double onager plus interdictor list can feel like super unfun to play against. Really? So specifically the uh, the other one that was being run with yeah, the interdictor. Yeah, with the interdictor. And like while it might not so- be so much stronger than other lists, it it just feels bad to play against you know kind of like you know some of the other degenerate lists that have existed in the past like you know Riken um, aces when it was in his prime and you know Sloan squadrons you know that that kind of thing where it's like yeah you can you can deal with it you can you can get a win maybe but like it's fucking it hurts to play against so it's actually interesting that you brought that up, especially with the interdictor, because when we got to that, I was going to make the argument that I thought that that is a terrible list from someone who plays interdictors on the regular. Yeah. I really do. Um, you know, especially when you re- remind yourself that interdictors can go speed three, and that's very useful. Uh, sorry, not interdictor. The onager, onager can go speed three. That's very useful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the interdictor can't. So you're really stuck doing whatever the interdictor can do. I think a lot of it is um, just having those three ships, how they can control the board. Like, Interdictor is all already a really good ship for board control, and additionally so for the Onagers, just because of like how far they can shoot, how they can ignore Salvo on their ignition shots. So you, you have a huge command of the board, and Interdictor only helps with that even more with you know its graph shift reroute, uh, it can, you know, have enemies start the game at speed zero if they deploy in, like, its grab well token area, which only helps the onagers further. And mm-hmm. it's just, uh, I, th- I just think it's, like, a lot to approach, especially against, like, a really good player who knows how to deploy and knows how to take advantage of those things. So it's, okay. it's just difficult, so, I think. I see the value in, in those items. Um... But when you're bringing those three ships, you're also not bringing a lot to the table. Where's your squadrons going to be? And that's that's one of I the doubt things. You're yeah. Have any. Like you, you definitely have um, a lot of weaknesses, and especially just I don't think the Onager is very good overall. But I disagree. But we'll continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it still makes it difficult as a list to approach. Okay. All right. You know, I can definitely concede that being a difficult list to approach, but, you know, I would say I probably get the same amount of anxiety when I see you bring 13 vulture droids to the table. (laughs) Man, vultures are so good, though. Right? And then, you know, especially, like, when you start doing uh, what I think is a really cool thing, not a scummy thing, um, with, I believe it's Grievous, where you start sending your... uh, 
squadrons off the table oh, to get yeah. those defense tokens the back. Fucking, right? The ultra sacrifice like to Grievous. Yeah. That's just fucking cool, that's, right? But that's like a really cheeky move. That's a really cheeky move. Uh, I <laughs> don't think it's how they intended Grievous to be played. And I think the, that their ruling on that is not super correct. I don't think you should be able to suicide your vultures. It's mm, just... I don't know. I shouldn't be able to use a defense token like four times, five times in a round. You pay you for know? it. I don't think you do. You pay for no, it Like hard, if though. someone says, here, take this upgrade, it's 16 points, and you can use your defense tokens four or five times in a round, like how many times do you take that in your list? Like the same defense token. Like you use brace four yeah, or five times every in a time. round. You take that upgrade every time, right? Yeah, but again, like, what is it costing every time you do that in an entire squadron? The, like, you literally the, the give me points is to only do that. Eight points is what I'm saying. It's yeah, but you give me eight points. It's not just like you lose the ship and you don't have a ship. It's that plus you give me eight points. Yeah, I mean that's one way to think about it. But also, it's the I get to use thermal shields that many times, or oh, I get shit. to use I get to keep my 140 point providence alive for another turn while your ship just stands there and can't do anything against it you know it's it's super it's a significant advantage and i think that grievous at 20 points only exacerbates the problem you should be at least 25 28 points uh yeah it's, here's the thing you like you're bringing it up in combination with the made of my existence being that thermal shield card yeah so like once, once you get into the point where you're using thermal shields four times in a round, then it's like, mm, it, it feels really strong. Right. So let's let's bring it back to the core. Is that more cheeky than a double onager and interdictor, or less cheeky? I would say that that is more cheeky than a double. It's more cheeky for sure, but it does. Uh, it it still feels pretty bad. Mean? Yeah. Like I would say that like. I would feel worse seeing that happen and having thermal shields be reused than taking a couple early shots from an Oninger. Yeah, I agree. But anyway, let's talk about um, specifically like what you brought and the games yes. you had. Because I know our second game, we played each other, but like I didn't really... We did. I didn't experience your first game, which I think you were against a Starhawk. Um, yeah, you know, it was actually a really excellent lineup for having those double onagers. Um, I did have the large Starhawk to shoot at, which was really good. I'm trying to remember for the life of me uh, what our objective was. Um, opening Salvo, oh, okay. that's what Salvo. it was. That's a great one for onagers. Oh, no. I believe that's one that you and I had, actually. I, I'm, I'm mistaken, right? Oh, yeah, I think we did have opening Salvo. Yeah, you and I had opening Salvo. Man, what did we have? I don't know. I got a picture on the... Uh, on the notes. Yeah, let me go scroll down. I should be able to tell from... I mean, only I have one I, picture, but... Yeah, I should have taken more. I was just... Honestly, I was really enjoying the game. Well, well, run us through your list. Run us through what, what your list okay. was and what your first match was. And then we'll do my, my first match, and then we'll do uh, our second match where we played each other. All right, so yeah, for my first list, um, I had oh God, my first list. For my list, it was the double onagers. I did have a victory uh, with nothing but Darth Vader on it. Um, really, just you know, uh, his flagship there staying alive. Um, for the onagers, they both had the same upgrades. Uh, they were both the Star Destroyer variant, so the variant that actually works. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did have the, if I'm not mistaken, composite. Um, super weapon upgrade the, yeah, the blue, the blue mid range one yes uh again the one that works and does well um both of those had those we both had intel officers uh, we both had the weapons team that allows us to change our accuracies to criticals um you know definitely when you're running uh the uh, mid-range onager that is just necessary you have to have the crit otherwise everything else you're doing is worthless yeah pretty um, much <laughs> And I did experiment. Uh, you know, I did have the ability to have the, I believe, XX. Uh, yeah, because uh, I think I think you had, you brought fire control teams and XX nines. XX nines, exactly. Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, so, so tell me what the thought process was behind that, because you had. That's like super ambitious. Yeah, um, you know, I was really, <laughs> I was really banking on crits, and on it, I was making them. I, I think I had a crit for every shot that I needed. 
Um, and when I did get through to the shields, it was two face-up upgrade cards. Oh, sorry, two face-up damage cards. Yeah. And when you're having that with an onager, you're getting those on the you know second round, third round. It makes the rest of the game very, very difficult. Um, I think one of the first uh, criticals that was dealt, my opponent was in, was not able to use accuracies with the starhawk. Um, so my salvos were going off as much as I needed them um, when he was even able to shoot at the onager. Uh, and then I think the other one was uh, affecting his maneuverability. He lost a tick of yaw. So uh, again, oh, on the so starhawk, the onager just yeah. or the the starhawk just goes straight then. It doesn't get yep, to do fucking yep. anything. And, and granted, like his positioning was good, right? So he had um, you know double arcs when he needed them. Um, but again, like the salvo was just kind of helping me out there. And oh, another really big thing now that I'm remembering the objective, it was the contested outpost. The outpost uh, was not a blocking obstacle, and it did not heal his starhawk. Oh, so you can just he was punch right through. Yeah, yeah. And, I'm, I'm um, looking at at the image I took of, of that, and the starhawk is yeah. like sitting right behind the, the station. I'm like, oh, that's an obstructed shot for sure. But if it's but contested it's outpost, then you just get to fucking wail on that Starhawk. And he's not healing. Because he was going slow, right? Um, once he got me in range, he definitely slowed down. So, no healing every time. It was bad. Yeah. So you did well that game? What What did it end up being? Like a 7-4? Mm. I didn't do as well as I thought in that game. So one thing that I'm finding with the double onager list is you're always going to lose one onager. Um, there's just no way to keep them both. I mean... I'm sure there's a way, but I can't keep them both alive. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it was expensive, right? Having intel officers, uh, the upgrades, you know, what I needed to do to get uh, both of those crits, uh, the face-up crits. So it was very expensive. He ended up taking out the one ship. I did take out the Starhawk, but I believe that was all that actually ended up dying. Um, so I ended up winning with a seven-four. Yeah, could have been better. Um, you know, as far as helping my tournament standings. Yeah, it seems like it. Uh, tell me about your first game. You know, I wasn't present for that. So my first game, as you know, was against uh, Matt. So I'm running uh, Separatists. Uh, I've been loving Separatists ever since they came out, especially since they've got the Providence and the Recusant once they came out. So I've been loving them. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been running this kind of generic fleet, I would say. It, it's more of like a combined arms that has, you know, all of the highlights of CIS. Munificent comms with Watt Tambor, disposable capacitors, LTT and, and top 12. Hard cell battle refit with Martuk, LTT. Another hard cell battle refit with LTT. Hard cell transport, flight commander, bomber command center, and then squadrons. We've got all the good aces, DBS-404, Grievous, both of the Tri-Fighter aces. A generic Belboab, Hyena Bomber, and just a single Vulture. And this is so, a list I've found that just does everything well. I can really contest squadrons unless they have some hyper-focused squadron list, like 134 points, flight controllers. Like, barring running up against a fleet that has that, I just completely dominate the squadron fight. And then DBS 404 and the high mid just choose away that whatever is in front of me. If memory serves, that's basically what happened during our uh, second game, yeah. is I was getting chewed alive by those squadrons. Yeah. But I was up against uh, one of our local players, Matt, who is, mm -hmm. uh, as Very I would good. describe, my fucking nemesis. <laughs> Whenever Accurate. I play him, I either completely lose or... I just struggle to get a 6-5. He, he builds lists in a way that I would never do. Like, every time I look at his list, I'm like, aren't you being, like, inefficient with some of your upgrade cards? Like, don't you think this would be better? Or, and then he takes you to town. And then he's like, let me show you. Let me show you what will happen. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, okay, dude, like, that's fine. And I get completely dominated, or I, I'm just like it's like i'm being dragged I'm, I'm like tied to a horse and i'm just being dragged along the ground <laughs> the entire game just trying to to get a breath of air 
And so this is uh, really crazy for me to hear, right? Because like, especially like when you and I play, like you're very calculated. I feel like you have the next three turns figured out. Um, and I usually feel like I'm being dragged by a horse, yeah. right? So to hear you say this is really yeah, something. Just, just imagine me having the next three turns figured out, playing against a guy who has the whole game figured out. Ugh, ugh, how disheartening. Yeah, so it's really difficult to play against him. And like what what he brought is just so confusing to me because I would never bring this. What was it? He's got well, first off, I don't know what any of his objectives were because uh, mm-hmm. I chose I, I got second player. He had a Kuat with Moff Jarjarod, Expert Shield Techs, Darth Vader boarding teams, ECMs, the fuck? leaving shots, ACM, Chimera, and entrapment formation. So this is very strange because like half of those are like definite like medium to long range kind of upgrades but then the rest of them are like i'm gonna get in your face and i'm gonna wreck your shit yeah for sure that is really interesting he's got two architons light cruisers one has director krennic and slaved turrets the other has captain nita and trc's wait so and he doubled up with the the not doubled up but he included director krennic as well in the architons light cruiser yeah he's got Two Gazantes. One is an assault carrier, the one that has the red dice at the front, with Taskmaster Grint and Comsnet. The other Gazanti is the the cruiser with Hondo and Comsnet. Nothing strange there, but it's just like not for you. Why why take assault carrier with Grint? It's like you're making it like more expensive than it needs to be. Why not just take another cruiser? And then he's got. Sienna Re and Valen Rudor, Ooh. which is pretty pretty normal. But it's like mm-hmm. all the Architons and the Kuat. I'm just I'm looking at it. And I'm like confused as to what he's taking and like what he's trying to do. It, well, I mean, just to kind of expand on what I was saying, you know, when I look at my my fleet building, like okay, I want this fleet to be good at let's say squadrons, right? And I think that when he builds his fleet, he doesn't look at it like that. He's like, I want this ship to be good at squadrons, and I want this ship to be good at long range. And and again, counter to that, I would say, okay, I want my fleet to be long range, so I might do a bunch of Simons. Yeah. Um, I think he really looks at it at a more individual level per ship than perhaps maybe you or I do. I think that's really good for Empire, because if someone asks me, like, what Empire's ship play style is is that they have, they're have? they really good at having individual playmakers like Demolisher, like Avenger. And I think, I think yeah. he's taking it yeah. to the extreme when he plays. But, like, I would never invest in Krennic on a light cruiser with slave turrets. You know? Krennic is expensive, right? He's eight points. Yeah, dude, officer, so when that dies... And slave turrets is six, and it's like, I'm... I want my Architons to like survive the game, so I, I normally kit them out with TRC and advanced projectors. So mm-hmm. I can use all their shields, I get guaranteed damage, and he's he just goes completely towards the realm of not just adding variants with slave turrets, mm-hmm. but guaranteeing damage with director credit. And so alongside his commander, Jerjerod, he got to be wherever the fuck he wanted and roll as many dice as the Architons can dish out. So it's three out the sides, plus one for slave turrets, plus one for con fire, which he had every time. Hmm. Rerolls with Krennic. And so the Architons would hit me with like seven damage. Just that one. That's really painful. And that's from an Architons. Just from an Architons. Ooh. And so it, it was really difficult. And I was trying to punch one of them down early in the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were playing, uh, what were we playing? Abandoned mining facility. So I set up everything okay. around the dust cloud. I was trying to get a lot of tokens. And that's really what saved me in the end. If he picked something else, I think it would have been a complete scoop. Because I, I got like 120, 140 points off of an abandoned mining facility. That definitely made a big difference. Yeah, so we, so we ended with a 7-4. Oh, that would have been, like, 
almost a total wipe otherwise. No, it would have been a complete fucking wipe. So how the game played out, really, is I got an early jump on his squadrons, uh, Sienna Reeve, Valen Rudor, and they were, they were pretty much done at the end of round two, Sienna Reeve, Valen Rudor, because I, I was just able okay, to so position my... Okay, so you tore into them. Hmm? Uh, you tore into them, that took away their scatters? Yeah, took away, took away their scatters, just really jumped on them. Oh, like, I used DIS T81 to snipe Sienna Reeve so she couldn't counter. Um, I moved Flak R Fock prototypes into range so they activated. They both took a damage already, so they were at like one health at the end of like round one. Really unfortunate, like if, when you're bringing token squadrons like that, you really want them to survive into round three. Um, but it just allowed my bombers to start chewing into his Kuat, I think at, at the top of round three. But. It really didn't give me the advantage I wanted because he had fucking expert shield techs. So even though I had full squadron domination, mm-hmm. I had my tri fighters which roll blacks at, at, at ships. They sure fucking do. I had my hyenas free. And I, I'm attacking him, and he's just like, well, I'll just reduce that damage by one. And I'm like, doesn't it go to a minimum of one? And he's like, no, no, no. Expert shield text doesn't have a minimum. If you only mm-hmm. do one damage, I take nothing. Mm-hmm. And so all my squadrons are trying to, to, to plink in damage, and he's just like, no, they don't. Do, they actually don't do anything. They don't. They don't hit me. They just miss. That hurts. It does hurt, especially because like the tri fighters, I'm I'm bringing them because of the consistency. And it's just worthless. And, and my hyena, especially DBS 404, I'm like, uh, crit hit, double hit. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'll just, um, I'll brace it to two expert shield techs. I'll take one damage. What, um, <laughs> next? And I'm Jesus. like, well, that was supposed to be the high roll. Be the high roll. And then he's just popping hard cells with his architons that are doing, like, an oblivion level damage. And I just, I get completely wiped off the board. All my squadrons are still alive, obviously, because I dominated the squadron yet. But it doesn't matter, because everything Do else is dead. This sounds more consistent than that time I was using, like, three interdictors and all the targeting scramblers in the world. Yeah, just some expert shield techs. Yeah, like, it sounds like he was able to mitigate the damage even better than that. Yeah. Because he was choosing as opposed to just hoping for the good roll. Or a worse role, I guess. Yeah, he, he was deciding. He was saying, "Wow, I'm choosing to not take this damage right now because I know I'm in a good position. You've already activated your ship. I'm not going to take a hit this round. It was it was pretty devastating. I'm really impressed. I'm not going to lie. He's, he's just... I think he's one of the better players in Florida, like overall. I think there's maybe one or two other players that are better than him. Hmm. But other than that, it's... Every time I've played him, I feel like I understand the game better. That seems and like I don't know how he's doing it. I don't know who the fuck he's playing against in his free time. But it's himself. <laughs> it's just himself. <laughs> he's like he's like one of those nerds Yikes. that like plays chess against themselves because they can't find anyone to contest them. But it's it's oh always gosh. fucking I believe it though. Play him. Um, so at the end of the game, obviously I had no more ships and all my squadrons. Um and he had both his Arkitans and both his Gazantis. I was able to get the Kuat, but at the end of the day, that's just not enough. And he did one of these plays where, you know, I had two of my hearth cells with Martuk, so they're like, they're throwing a lot of dice at a single Arkitans. And I, I, I get damage on it, I get the shields down, and then he uses Jergerod and just positions his other Arkitans right in front of the damaged one. And so that is now very skillful. any shot that I take on the damaged architons is obstructed. Obstructed. And so I can't kill it. Across both of the architons, I did enough damage to kill one. But it it didn't matter. It didn't matter at the end cuz he 
he just spread all the damage and it was really tragic. Just, just when he positioned that Arcatins was really like when you're playing a game and you're like, oh, that move cost me the game. That move made I, it to I where think, I lost. And he did yes. that in like round three. Like round three, he um, did that to me. And I was like, oh, the next three rounds, I'm just trying to survive, which I did not. You can pull a Deej and just head to the other corner of the board. I know. I, I tried. I, I tried to jump onto the station to get as many mm -hmm. tokens as I could so that I could kind of like you know, pad my loss, but it it didn't matter. I, I lost. I lost, like, round three. Is there anything, looking back, um, you know, not fleet building-wise, but from a tactical decision that you think could have turned that game? Mm. Yeah, I know, tough question, right? That is a tough question. I don't think so. I think if we deploy the same way we do, each game, I think I lose every time. Interesting. So deployment was really where it was at for that game. Yeah. He just had such a, a domination of the area. He knew where my hard cells were going to be. He had Jer Gerard, so he was never taking a bump when when he didn't want to. Mm -hmm. He was, like, deciding to bump me or deciding to get his ISD, like, just jump it over my hard cells. He... He could just say, oh, I'm going speed three. I'll take a damage for Jerjerod and get a double click at one and put my ISD where it needs to be. He, he never landed on an obstacle after, like, the first debris field mm -hmm. that he took. And even with him taking the debris field, I wasn't able to kill the ISD when I wanted to. Like, I think round four or five was when I killed the ISD. Mm -hmm. And I had to sling squadrons, like, all the way down range because... He was out of range of all my ships with his Kuat. So I had to I had to throw DBS 404 over there. I had to throw my Tri Fighters over there. And I was just barely able to kill his Kuat by like my last roll. And then once that happened, both my other ships died and the game was over. It cost too dearly to do it. Yeah, but if, if I didn't kill his Kuat, it would have been... He killed everything in my fleet, and I kill nothing of his. That's really tough, dude. I, I like I don't even know what to say. <laughs> um, there's there's not yikes. much to say. It's just you know sometimes you play against someone who's really fucking good. Just got a good fleet. Yeah, and they've got a good fleet, and they're prepared for everything. But yeah, if I had to uh, ask myself the same question for my first match, I definitely think that. Uh, it, you know, especially looking at the pictures, if he had swapped the location of the Corvette and the Flotilla uh, to being on the side closer to the Onager, um, you know, that way I either had to focus on them first or shoot through them to get to the Starhawk, I think he would have had the opportunity to get the Starhawk into a flanking position. And I think that he could have done better in that game. Yeah, for sure. But like with so, that, when I, when I see a list that has a Starhawk and it's got, what, like three or four squadrons? I just want them to have more. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. I think the Starhawk, well. you take the Starhawk, you take two GR-75s, and you take a shitload of Rogue Squadrons. And then, then it's, That would have given me a hard time. That, uh, that would have given you a hard time. Like, you take Lando, you take a uh, fucking, like, Shara, Tycho, you take some other fucking Rogue Squadrons, like a bunch of YT-2400s. Mm-hmm. And you just, you, like, if he's going against your fleet, like YT-2400s, they're speed four, and they just start rolling dice against you, and it's, they just start chewing away. I think you would have had a better time. I have to say time. that but like, the squadrons, um, the ones with Rogue, are definitely the bane of my existence when it comes to the Onager. Yeah. Uh, it really, like, the other ones I can handle, right? Worst case scenario, I just switch to throwing out Fleck. Like, you've seen me do that before, mm -hmm. but when they have Rogue, you just, you can't kill them in time. Yeah, because a lot of the rogue squadrons have so much fucking health. Mm -hmm. They're like five to mm -hmm. eight. It's not worth shooting at them. You just have to go for the total fleet kill. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things I found when I'm playing games, especially with CIS, is if mm -hmm. you if you overcommit with your squadrons, and you you sling them down the board, and they have nothing else to shoot at, obviously mm -hmm. they're going to shoot they're at just your gonna squadrons. Shoot it. Yep. And you don't want that. You want your squadrons 
and your ships to both be targeted in the same spot so that yep. they have to choose even better if you have multiple ships obviously if they don't have gunnery teams because then they'll just pick both your ships and fucking blast them out of the sky but but you want the choice um and you want the choice to be hard i think that we should start making a list of golden rules for armada yeah and i think that the number one is give your opponent more than one thing to shoot at yeah so they have to choose i guess that way people don't get that mixed up but yeah well, definitely so that i think was, that's a golden rule that was both of our round uh round ones we correct talk about our round two which was you versus me yeah so this one's gonna be a lot easier to talk about because yeah. it was against you uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh i did lose this one um i don't know I, I i felt good about the match when we started mm -hmm. and then it deteriorated very very quickly i think that um all right so yeah when i have these two onagers what i have to go for if you have any amount of squadrons is a total fleet kill mm -hmm. um I, I have to um you had some you had a good amount of squadrons and then you had those three hard cells and I don't know why I thought I could do it. There's just no way for three ships to focus on those four targets and actually kill them by the end of turn six. Yeah. I um, actually so yeah, I think you had me disagree there. with you. Tell me more. I think your list is crippled by having a commander that's too expensive. It doesn't give you any benefit mm. to re-rolling like you think it does. And I think if you had like Jerjerod and just some other upgrades that let you re-roll, like Darth Vader Officer, that'll let you re-roll when you need to, who perfectly syncs up with your in Intel Officer, um, and you put disposable capacitors on the Victory 2, I think that this game is a loss for me. Because so Really? Oh, yeah. Because so many times you had, like, you had range on me with the VSD on one of my hard cells, if not two of them, mm -hmm. but you were only able to roll like three or four die with a confire, three reds, and then I just discarded my evade, it's whatever, no damage happens. Like if you have disposable capacitors and you're rolling your full salvo at long range and my hard cells just start getting bled like round two, and then once you kill whatever ship, you just Jerjerod and you just cut right to the other ship. Uh, I don't think I can do anything against that. But the thing with, mm -hmm. like, you just take Darth Vader Officer on, like, your victory. Mm -hmm. And when your ship shoots, if you roll poorly, instead of burning your defense tokens, not burning them, but exhausting them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I do. You roll your dice, you tap Intel Officer, and then you use Darth Vader Officer... And you kill the intel officer. His effect stands. He lets you re-roll whatever you want. And then that's it. Ooh. So with an onager, you're doing these things very early in the game. I'm super hesitant to kill the intel officer at turn 2 and turn 3. Whereas with, you know, Vader as, his, as a commander, um, you know, I'm able to turn 2, get that dice roll that I need. And uh, just think about the... What was it like the first game that you and I played with my double onager? Mm -hmm. What did I do? Like nine damage, something ridiculous that you just couldn't couldn't handle. Yes. Um, and and while yeah. what you're saying is true, ships only have so much health. So either they don't use their brace because obviously you will target that with your intel officer, mm -hmm. and you get all that damage through anyway, and the next round mm -hmm. you just fucking killed them because they took the damage, or they use their brace, mitigate the damage from that shot, and then die next turn because they don't have a brace. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you only have to do That's so fantastic. I love this situation. Yeah. <laughs> like, they have to decide if both decisions are bad. Yes. So That sounds fantastic. And, and if you have a better commander, because you know Darth Vader is a great commander for re-rolling, but Darth Vader Officer is really good for situations like this. And you have Jerjerod, and you just take a shield damage, and you put your Onager wherever the fuck you want, wherever you think they're going to be next round. Mm -hmm. And especially for this game, because you had first player, you know, I, I just think that's a different game. And I think you take that one. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it's 
It's hard, and you know, the part of it too, like when building this list, is like that is a super efficient, great way to fly the Onager. I, I think a big portion of what I was trying to do, though, is I was really trying to have fun with these crits. I really wanted to have the uh, the XX nines work, to have those double crits pop up, and that was really fun. Like whenever someone <laughs> brings fire control team, I know they're doing something like pretty ridiculous, mm -hmm. but as far as like XX nines go, I don't know about that. I mean, I don't think I'm gonna do it again. It's fun, um, <laughs> but it's just one of those yes. cards that's like a win more card. You know, mm -hmm. like it says the first two damage cards dealt to the defender by this attacker dealt face up. Already implying you're doing two damage. Already implying you're doing two damage cards. It's like, okay, um, I'm already winning. Now I just want to make you feel bad by drawing two face ups. I see. I see where you're coming from, and like, yeah, I know you're. I have no to, argument for that. I, I know you're. You're using the fire control team to get both of them off, just for that. That fucking sweet, sweet double face up. But like, okay. if it's just XI sevens instead, it's just. I I think I just fucking lose even against the same fleet you took. So I think in the future, um, yeah, XI sevens are going to be stapled. I think to my onager. I think that is just too good. It's just um, too good for what the onager outputs at once yeah so so with all of that mm -hmm. we've got our our little picture that we're looking at while we're talking about our match what would you uh -huh. do differently in this game to try and force a so outcome? tactically and not from a fleet composition perspective looking at this uh, honestly i think i would have tried to ram bit more i think that i would have tried to because you weren't going too fast with the hard cells um i think i would have tried to position an onager with each of your hard cells same with the victory yeah try to ram them for damage while shooting at the flagship yeah that might have worked you want to know my advice tell me don't fuck up your fleet commands and leave your onager at speed zero <laughs> oh you know what i don't want to talk about that actually <laughs> <laughs> That I have really completely removed that from my memory. That really fucked yeah, you up. That was a bullshit. It was, it was a cool move because it just kept you away just that little bit longer to where I couldn't shoot you with my hard cell. No, I needed my brace. And, and then it, <laughs> I needed it my fucking, salvo. It, it botched you up. I think that was the first time I've ever messed up my commands. Yeah. I don't think I've ever done that, especially, especially at a tournament. Yeah, that, but that's that the downside when you're running the same thing, you know, like two ships that are exactly the same. Yeah, you just get confused and then something doesn't mm -hmm. match up. Yeah, I had a, what happened is I confused it with a victory, it's uh, command dials. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what happened. But anyway, those so. were great games. And a big thing here is, I mean, I had fun. <laughs> that was a fantastic yeah. time. All Both of those games are, are just good. I think that the last one was, uh, I think, more fun for me than I've had. Not to say that the other ones aren't, but I think that one, uh, last one was especially a really good time. Yeah. Um, so what, what uh, were some of the other um, fleets that you saw around the table? Well, we kind of touched on this briefly. Uh, there was another double Onager build uh, we did see that did have the Interdictor. Yeah, that was, that the was a traditional one as its support. Um, so we did see that. Um, and it performed very well in the first round. I know they were going against a new player. And then in the second round, I they think, did not do very well. Uh, yeah, I think they got complete ganked. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just want to talk about uh, who got first place in the tournament. Uh, it was a Rebel player, and they took a Providence, one of, one of the new uh, ships from Rapid Reinforcements, as their flagship. Mm-hmm. They did pretty good against a double ISD in their first round. And then they okay, played tough... against um, the double onager and interdictor in their second round. And in the second round, they just completely wiped the double onager and interdictor. Mm. I was talking with them after the tournament, and they took like two damage cards, and that was it. And it was, did they, it was um... 10 0. Oh wow! Did they give any like particular reason that really gave them such a solid win? Any any info there? Just not being in the Onager's fucking ignition arc. 
They just completely that, avoided it. That's it. I mean, they, they had three CR-90s, a transport, and a Providence, and some A-Wings. And that was it. And the Providence they was, were, was kitted out. They could out. be wherever they wanted then. Yeah. So that was interesting. You know, something to be mindful with the way that the uh, tournament pairings work is that um, the better that you do in the first round, you're going, to go in, you're going to go against someone that did equally well in the second round. Yeah. Um, so it was probably, you know, two top tier lists going against each other. Yeah, um, but that was fun. Yeah. I really like doing these tournaments. Looking at other ones here, uh, anything in particular from your memory? No, I think everything else played out as normal. Mm -hmm. Nothing super shocking. Uh, I mean, just the, the super shocking thing was that the Rebel Providence like took the whole thing. I think that's just such a bizarre and weird ship for the Rebels. Who was flying that list? Andy. Well, you know, and that's part of it too. That's part of right? it, because <laughs> he is a fucking killer. Yes. He's just one of yeah. those guys uh, who Consistently likes, too. I, I don't want to get paired up against him. That's fucking... He's really fucking good. You want to move on to our second segment? Yep, so we have tournament findings reports. Alright, so, so we're talking about big tournament stuff here. Yes, yeah, so this was the um, 2022 Team International Tournament. I think this mm -hmm. was a TTS tournament. Um, but I can't be sure. It, some guy posted this like on Facebook... Mm -hmm. And he had, like, all of these analytical images. I mean, if you're listening and you recall that, I mean, that's what we're talking about. Uh, TTS. Uh, that's Tabletop Simulator. Spell that out. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. And so this is, a like, an analytics post that has several different images that have upgrade cards, ship cards, commanders... And overall, there were 112 players with 112 lists. And this is kind of the breakdown of what upgrades were taken, in what capacity, how many people had, you know, Intel officer out of all of the lists. And then it breaks it down even further per faction. And so, so that's um, what we're we'll talking about big standout for me just looking at you know the most used per slot uh image here uh gr75's most used ship and i think that's crazy because it doesn't shoot i think that's totally fair because it is a cheap activation and i think that this really just highlights um how valuable having the activation uh advantage or even just not the disadvantage is um, yeah, you know, people are bringing this ship consistently. What's even crazier is that there's 36 rebel lists that mm -hmm. were in this tournament, and there were 51 GR75s. <laughs> so out oh, of those wow. 36 lists, that. like several Most of, of them had them more than one. Had more than one, which I'm, I don't think is that strange. I think they're really good. They're amazing at pushing squadrons. And I think that's just an advantage of being a rebel player. Like, mm -hmm. you just get an extra activation, and that activation gets to push your squadrons. I think that's fine. What is the squadron value for the GR-75? Do you know off the top Two. of your head? Three with the token. Do you, know, do you know what it is for the Corvette? For the Corvette, I think it's one. Yeah, I, well, of course, that is only 50% of the GR-75. I'm going to go ahead and say that I think the Corvette is infinitely more valuable than the GR-75. Yeah, but GR-75 can take expanded hangar bay plus a token. That's four squadrons, man. Four squadrons for 23 points. Okay, yeah, I didn't think that through all the way. And the Rebel squadrons are really <laughs> fucking good. They are the best, I think. And, and it can take a power officer like Leo Organa so that your big ship is command one basically mm. you know that's that's 26 points you know I, I, so it's it's really convincing for me yeah no i i think that that is some valuable insight and yeah i can't argue that at all um another big standout here 
Let's see what we got. I'm kind of surprised to see uh, the titles kind of so high up here. Um, I don't know. I think that, I guess for the new stuff, the titles are very strong. It's very cool. I don't know. I think I think the biggest standout for me is anything that's over like half. You know, things like the GR75, which is 51 out of 112. Mm. But mainly it's linked turbo laser te- uh, turrets. I'm not at all surprised to see that. Are you kidding me? I'm not surprised either. I just think that it is really telling as to that this card should not exist. Because out mm. of the 112 lists, there are 76 linked turbo laser towers. How many points does it cost? Seven. I do not think that this is better than my XI7s. I think it is. But I think it's depending on what fucking uh, faction you're playing. Like, if you're playing Separatists, it's LTT on every ship. And that's it. And you'll see that in this breakdown, because 44 of the Link Turbolaser turrets in this whole tournament is in CIS. Like, it's the most taken upgrade. That says a lot. I mean, CIS really depend on their red dice, and they really depend on squadron domination, and Link Turbo Laser Towers does both! So, why do you think that for that faction specifically, LTT is so much better than something like XI-7s? Or perhaps anything else in the Turbo Laser slot? I'm curious. So really, CIS, they have a lot of red dice, and they don't have reliable ways to re-roll them like other factions. They don't have Vader, Officer. They don't have Kaken and Sholwim. They don't have these options. Really, the only officer they have for re-rolls is Shumai, and you have to choose two rounds out of the game, and it's only three dice you can re-roll. But it takes your fucking officer slot. That is actually really shitty. Yeah. Additionally, hard cell battle refits, three reds out the Mm -hmm. front, you put LTTs on them, they've got blue-black anti-squadron, with a confire, you can roll at one, let's say a generic squadron, let's say a generic arc runs up on you, Mm -hmm. you roll blue-black on them, you LTT for two more black, you confire for another black. That squadron's fucking dead now. Yeah. And so now you just don't have to fucking worry about that anymore. I'd be so pissed. Yeah. Okay, fair. Um, but my problem with Link Turbulizer Towers is it's too good for its cost. It should be at least 12 or 14 points. No, I'm not going to argue that. <laughs> because there's uh, already... 100%. There's it, it shouldn't be this good. Like, mm. like in reality... It should be two separate cards. The top part, while attacking, you may re-roll one die in your attack pool. I mean, that's that's worth seven or eight points. And then the bottom part, when attacking the first squadron during your activation, you may add two dice of any color to your attack pool. Can't declare additional squadrons. That should be its own separate card. Because, and let's compare, dual turbo laser turrets is five mm-hmm. points. You exhaust it to re-roll, to add one die to your attack pool if you do choose and cancel one attack die. It's essentially just a re-roll. That's yeah. five points. So for two more points, you just get a card that's infinitely better and has infinitely better choices than dual turbo laser turrets could possibly offer you. And that's also a turbo laser slot, right? Exactly. They're both in the same slot. Yep. Yeah, so if you, if that other thing that you mentioned was uh, the dual turbo lasers was in a different slot, I would make the argument, well, you, you know, it's also what you are not putting in this slot, because it's taking up, I think, one of the most valuable slots for, say, an Imperial player, aside from uh, the gunnery. Yeah, So I agree. Uh, but it's not. That's not the case. So you make a very strong point. I think that know, linked that turbo laser it towers, should be separate. it should be dual turbo laser turrets is the top part, where it just lets you reroll one red die. And Heavy Fire Zone, which is a card that exists in the game, trust me, um, should be, it adds uh, two die of any color when you're attacking the first squadron. 
And I don't nope. think Link to Everly's uh, Tower should exist at all in the game. I just think it's too good. It, it gives you too many no. options. It lets you re-roll one red die in your attack pool against any shot. Which, if you look at dual turbo laser towers or turrets, it exhausts to essentially re-roll one red dice. Mm-hmm. And I how mean, much is leading shots? Do you know off the top of your head? Six. It's six for six. leading shots. But I mean, you get oh, to re-roll. Wow, that's only anything. one point less. And you have to. Okay, well, you still give up a die though. Exactly. There's no. There's no deficit for taking link turbo laser mm. towers. And honestly. You use Link Turbo Laser Towers. Let's say you've got red anti flak, which Separatists have on their comps, frigates, their munificence. And the, the recusant support has red anti flak. You just get to re roll that red dice every single fucking time. So, so let me uh, pick your brain here, and this is actually going to help me understand your value of this card. What's more important to you? Or what do you think is better? Adding a die to an attack uh, with, say, a con fire, or having a reroll. Reroll every single time. Doesn't matter what color of dice it is. But that, to be fair, is just my play style. I value consistency over variance. Okay. Now, is that like a mathematical fact, or is this just an opinion that you have? This is my own personal play style. Like, okay, I'm gonna have to look into this. Let's say, well, you don't have to look into it. I'm about to talk about it. Let's say we've got a Vulture class <laughs> droid fighter squadron and a droid right. tri fighter squadron. Okay. If we're talking about against squadrons, I value the Vulture droid fighter squadron over the droid tri fighter. Because it's got the droid tri fighter has red, blue, blue, plus an additional red or blue AI anti squadron. And the mm-hmm. Vulture has blue, black, plus a black or a blue for AI anti squadron. Now the Vulture against Squadrons has black, which when I'm playing the Squadron game, I'm trying to kill all of their generics as fast as possible and then dealing with the aces later. Because aces generally Ooh, smart. are really good against Squadrons and sometimes I know that there are areas in which ace Squadrons are really good against ships, but generally they don't, they don't do ships very much. And if they do extreme damage against ships, you can just put one squadron on them, and they can't really do anything. So it's fine. I think you just improved my game with this, because I usually do it the other way around. I focus on the aces. No, focus on the generics. Because wow, I just became a better b- player. Before the changes, before the limits to aces, you should focus on the aces for sure. But now, uh, fleets can only take four aces. Mm-hmm. Which means if you kill all of their other generics, they only have four squadrons. So, that makes even sense. even if they have like a squadron that's strong against ships, it's like there's only four of them. Hmm. I can tie up two or three of them for sure if I win the squadron game. So, back to my point. Yeah, please. Against ships, vultures roll one red, and tri fighters roll a black. So if I'm planning on attacking and using my squadrons against ships, it's tri-fighters every single time. They got 75% over the the vultures 37.5%. It's a big difference. Big fucking difference. And it made a big difference um, in my matches, for sure. I played a couple matches um, the other day, and the droid tri fighters were attacking ships that had evade defense tokens. They were spending them, and it didn't matter. They can't avoid the single damage black dice, and so that's what I value when I when I'm making fleets is the consistency. It's the link turbo laser towers. It's the droid. Tri-fighters. I think this is uh, this this explains to me why you value LTT so much. Then, um, okay, because Thank you. because I, in this whole insight. faction. They're starved for consistency. And you get that back by adding Link Turbo Laser Towers to essentially every single one of your ships that can take it. The only ship I wouldn't take it on is a Recusant Light Destroyer that has Patriot Fist. 
because you know obviously you put swivel mounts on it you kit it out with you kit it out with uh, like APTs or ACMs that's really the only ship that I don't put like turbo laser towers on fair enough wow very valid points I, uh, I, I have to say that I agree with most of them this time around yeah I've, I've been playing separatists a lot and I just really am really vibing with them even though that alongside Republic, they're super limited in the options they can have. I think that mm -hmm. just their play style right now is it's really fleshed out their play style. Fair. I really appreciate your insight into this, right? Because like I play Imperial, you know that. So uh, my experience with you know these different factions is on the receiving end. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's nice to kind of see like the other side, like you know the planning aspect of that. So it's very refreshing. Yeah. Um, let's move on to the next uh, image here. Uh, looks like we have most used for the Confederacy of, uh, C let's go ahead and say CIS. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit small, the image. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Yeah, you just double click here. on it and it'll, it'll boost it up for you. Is that how that goes? Yeah. All right, I think it's loading up. Um, good, sweet iPhone. Anyways, uh, so what's standing out to you here? Martuk. Tell me more. So, previously on... This, act, this same podcast, I lambasted Martuk as being utterly useless and the worst commander out of the entire faction. Are we going to have to backtrack? I'm going to have to backtrack. For All right. Sure. Because I've used him a lot, and my advice is put him on a ship where he can die. Like, you want Martuk to die. How counterintuitive. It is super counter counterintuitive, but I, I really love it. Like, bring a hard sell, put Martuk on him. If he dies round three, who gives a fuck? Like, at round three, all their shields that you're targeting should be gone. And so if Martuk is dead round four, now you don't have to worry about his deficit. Let's say you attack their, their rear, or their, their side hull zone, and they redirect mm -hmm. to the rear... It's like, if they don't have any shields anywhere, which, if you're playing against Martuk, you should really take advantage of, now you don't have to worry about removing a die. He's one of these commanders that says, round two, I'm really good. Round three, I'm pretty okay. Round four, I'm starting to take away from you. Round five, why am I still here? Round six, you've lost the game. So, because uh, I'm having an issue pulling up the image larger, how many points is he? He is 28 points. That is not bad. It's two less than Kraken, and it's eight more than Grievous. Uh, which, Grievous. in my mind, are the only three commanders for the Separatists. As I said, I don't think that's bad. So if you do lose them, I, I don't think it's like costing you the game specifically. So this is uh, interesting. I think this is like a reoccurring theme for the CIS of killing your own forces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like, like, don't talk to me about Grievous list because, ah, uh, fucking, I think Grievous is the most fun commander I've ever played in Armada. Really? Really, okay. really. It makes me feel invincible <laughs> when I'm playing Armada. It's, it's, I don't know how else to explain it. Grievous is probably my favorite commander. Out of, out of all of them. Out of all the factions, it's Grievous. And I think he's broken. I, I think it, it actually does not work as intended. I, I don't think so. From someone that's got against it a few times, I think it, it flows well. I don't, it's fun, dude. I don't know. When I start slinging vultures off and I get my brace back and refresh it in the same turn, it's like... I mean, it's it's fucking crazy, dude. I think, I think it's crazy and I think it's cool, right? But I don't think it's outside of the bounds of the game. If Grievous were to be twenty points, it should it should say uh, when a friendly ship or squadron is destroyed by the enemy player. <laughs> you know, no. but if, uh, I, if I it, don't agree with this one, if it's gonna take, if it's gonna keep its its you know, wording, it should be like 28 points, I think. It should be the same as Martuk. I'll admit that he is very cheap. He's, he's way too cheap. 
Um, unless they don't change the wording, I think he should be as expensive as Martuk because how offensive Martuk is in the early rounds, Grievous is as defensive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I think they should be costed equally. And this is me loving how cheap Grievous is right now. Well, hopefully he uh, hangs around at this price for a little while longer. Yeah. Uh, but also, hopefully, you know, we do see some potential updates and, you know, some uh, changes here. I'm always happy to see those. Yeah. And I can't wait to talk uh, about rapid reinforcements in one of mm. our next episodes because that has changed so much. Because, as we can see out of the uh, most used for Confederacy of Independent Systems, 20 of the 22 lists had Gazanti cruisers in them they're so good they're so good and this was one of the things i was bitching about a lot on previous episodes is list building for separatists is so fucking restrictive because hard sells are so expensive so i'd be making a list i'd have three ships i'd have squadrons and i have 40 points left over because i don't have a flotilla i've maxed out squadrons and I, I, I can't add anything. There's no room for anything else. And so I, I'm not surprised that there are a lot of uh, Gazantes in Separatists. Fair. Um, let's see. I think we were on the next image here. Most used for Galactic Empire. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm seeing something we're talking about. Sloan. I mean, not necessarily. It's pretty common to see her um i don't know like i think she's cool i i don't think she's fun personally now Um, the thing with sloan is same she gives me the same kind of feeling as when i'm playing rebels with dodonna mm -hmm. it's like i can win a game but it is not fun to win that way Mm -hmm. especially Mm -hmm. if you're playing with someone who is like new to the game or they're not as you know well versed in armada tactics as you are it feels unfun it it makes winning not fun which i agree on all fronts and it was really evident when i was playing sloan when she first came out and i was just trying to see how they worked and i was like Mm -hmm. this this card can't be real you just get to take away it the sure defense is. tokens, like before you even shoot. You know, it's it's like it's too much. Did they make any updates to her uh, when one point five came out? Just on like um, timings, I think points maybe. I think the biggest oh, okay. change to her was that, like, if you target a redirect, mm-hmm. and they have two redirects, they can spend the other one. But when she first came out, you couldn't. Oh. You see, that's like such a fine detail. I probably wouldn't have even noticed that while I played. Yeah, because like, like if you've got two redirects and Sloane spends one, you can't use the other redirect because technically it had been spent in that attack. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they changed her to obviously say that, that that's not how that works. And that makes sense. But still, okay. uh, so good. Too good for 24 points. For sure. So I'm not surprised she that cheap. she is the top commander from this tournament. Um, number two, we have Ramadi. Uh, again, I'm not really surprised, uh, just because he's cheap. Yeah, like Ramadi's ability is like and it's cool, good and cool. But like, honestly, it's not that much. One red die is like, honestly, that kind of sucks. I think the best benefit from Ramadi is that he is cheap. You know, with the likes of Ozil and that's it. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Ozil's the only other cheap Empire commander. And it could be argued, argued that Ozil is better. Because you can change your speed and on some of the Empire ships that is super significant. Yes. Uh, many times I've seen that definitely make a game just with a double arc. 
and getting where you need to be. So what do you think about the state of Empire alongside the Onisher right now? Because right now I'm looking and like 24 out of 33 Empire lists have Onisher testbed with the red laser. So first and foremost, I think everyone's doing it wrong with the test bed and the red laser. Yeah. I think that's silly. That's not what the onager is meant to be. It's, oh my. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Like I'm, I feel very strongly. Like it's just not a good ship. Well, this is the podcast of strong opinions and strong feelings. So if you feel Oof. strongly, like let's fucking hear them. Yeah. No. I mean, it's. It, it. I don't know. Like, sure. Like, long range is cool, um, but the game. There's so much more to the game than the long range shooting, um, and I think it's too many eggs in one basket. And the, uh, the test bed itself is not a good ship, which is the version that likes the red laser. And if you're going to use the Star Destroyer version, which is the good version, you should use the blue laser, just as how they're built. Um, so yeah, that's just how I feel about the Oninger. Uh, as far as why it's being used so much, and this is just something that I really feel, and it's one of the... F- sorry, it is the only way to naturally have a salvo. And I think that not having a salvo in Armada right now... Uh, on certain ships is a huge detriment. Dude, I fucking agree with you on that. Not only the test bed, because when I play against you and I see your Onager Star Destroyers with the blue laser, mm-hmm. that feels infinitely worse than a test bed with the red laser. Because mm-hmm. you're going to deal with it the whole game, not just round one and two. Exactly. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll just evade two of your four dice you know, if you get a good shot, I'll evade three of the red dice. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're running the test bed with the red laser. And its crit effect is things that are close to me take damage. But, like, if you get hit with the blue laser, that fucking, that sucks. Yes. That sucks so much. It's like every crit is in one more damage. That hurts mm-hmm. a lot. Mm-hmm. And then, you know... <sighs> You tend to take it on a shield that you're not getting shot on, uh, obviously, right? So your d- redirects are just becoming useless as that effect goes on. Yeah. So, uh, so good. Anyways, uh, so much better than the red one. Uh, but yeah, uh, and then of course, as I said, you know, uh, it's. I think it's being used so much. One, because it's cool, it's unique, uh, and y- you get salvo, and you don't have to uh, waste your gunnery team to do it. Yeah, I think... Honestly, there needs to be an upgrade that isn't local fire control. Yes. I think there needs to be something like... Maybe maybe it doesn't take up your weapons team slot. Maybe it takes your offensive slot. And it's like mm-hmm. integrated fire control teams. Or integrated fire control. That it just gives you a salvo. And your salvo doesn't replace a token. For like two more points or something because salvo has been so integral to the game that like replacing one of your defense tokens for it uh, that just doesn't cut it anymore do you know what i think that they should just do Mm. i think that they should just be like hey you know we messed up or we, we we thought of something different any contained token is now a salvo token i oh my god I know I said this was the podcast of hot takes and strong opinions, but not (laughs) that strong. I think that's totally wrong. I think contain is silly, especially when you have so many different other effects. I think that, hold on, I think that contain could be done with a card. Explain yourself. What do you mean contain could be done with a card? I think that, okay, as I said, contain really only works for the standard critical effect, okay? Well, I mean, that's in the rules, yeah. Yes, unless you have the card that lets it do otherwise. You should really... I think that that card should just exist. You should be able to exhaust it. You should be able to refresh it at the start of the turn. Uh, and you should be able to uh, just ignore one critical effect, period. I, I think... So you and think again, damage control officer should be the officer that says ignore a critical effect. Precisely. An and then I think that... And then if you just replace all the critical tokens with salvo, I think everyone will be happy. I don't know. I yeah, just from an fucking easy way to disagree do it. because I'm looking <laughs> at the why. interdictors with double contain. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, think about and, that though. And they've got fucking Wait, what's red, their rear blue, shot? blue. I think you're that's so beautiful. fucking wrong on this. 
No, I think that matches with the interdictor perfectly, and I think it solves no. its problems. I think it really brings it up to a usable ship if you do that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. That's a that's a strong opinion. That's that's it's an not opinion like it's that's so it twice. strong. It just, it, I don't know. You have to accuracy, it's super hard. If you, I don't know. If, I think that. I don't know. If mm. you go picketing for that opinion, you will not see me at your picket line. <laughs> I think that we should one day in the future before we die play an alt game where every uh, contain is a salvo. I think, and I'll run my three interdictors. I think that there should be <laughs> like an offensive retrofit card that adds a salvo instead of replacing a salvo from local fire control. Yeah, I'll take it. I just don't want it in the gunnery slot. That's my thing. Yeah, the gunnery slot's like so good. Especially if you need like gunnery team, flight controllers, or ordnance experts. It's like... Mm-hmm. Even if it's zero points, local fire control you don't take sometimes. You know? Mm -hmm. Yep. It's like depending on your build. And honestly, like... I think that makes sense. I weapons didn't, I didn't team, think about a zero point upgrade. Like, uh, the weapons team slot is like... It's so fucking contested that some of, some of the cards are too expensive. You know? How so? Well, I mean, we're looking at Galactic Empire. Yeah, yeah. Ordnance Experts is 25 of the 33 lists. I see that. And Ordnance Experts has been nerfed to where you can only reroll up to two black dice. Still really fucking good. And so it's, you only have to roll like three to four. Exactly. That's still and like 50%. I still think that Ordnance Experts isn't overpowered. Nope. And it's still taking it's that good. much. And I'm like, yeah, but it, it's, it should be. It should be taken if you're having a lot of black dice in your attack pool. Like, before it was just re-roll any amount of black dice. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I thought it was a good card, but I never thought it was OP. It, it was OP. <laughs> I just thought it was a really good card, and it was just like Gunnery Team, one of those that in a lot of situations will be glued to the ship. Yeah, I agree. So, But I, I think that's okay. I think it's okay to have certain cards that are really good with certain ships. Like, it just fucking makes sense. Like, that's how the world works. <laughs> yeah. All right, do you have um, any other thoughts on Galactic Empire, or...? Um, you know, just looking at it, uh, I, I see Corvus and I see Raykel, which makes me very happy. Uh, I think that that is super cool. I like to see kind of see unique see effects like that. Is that what it, you know, I, again, I'm kind of looking at the smaller image. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah, That's so that cataclysm. is Cataclysm. So, so scratch that. Cataclysm isn't that great. I don't care. Corvus, <laughs> super awesome. I love to see that. Really? Um, uh, yeah, no, I think it's just super awesome. And I try to use Corvus anytime that I use, um, that particular ship god i can't remember i think corvus is so, really good if you're just gonna make a lifeboat and put your admiral on it mm -hmm. you just and just put him somewhere you on just the start other side. with corvus <laughs> and you just put it somewhere else and then you're like oh you'll never kill my commander i, I think it's good yeah i'm a big fan of that yeah. um you know and especially like one thing you can do with like a, an interdictor is you could have some bombers <clears throat> you can have the corvus have the corvus deploy all the way on the right side lay out your bombers as it goes <clears throat> And then, uh, you know, you can move the Corvus later on if you need to deploy the Onager, like, all the way on the left or something. Yeah. You have the distance your Onager needs. The bombers are laterally closer to the opponent, so they kind of have to pick or choose, like, what direction. All of them seem to be in your favor. Yeah. So, uh, I know. I'm a big fan of the Corvus. I think that's just a really sneaky, really cool tactic. And, um, you know, I played uh, Battlefront 2, right? So, um I kind of have that attachment where that is the ship that you use. I don't know if you played the game. Did you? Battlefront 2? Yeah. Which Battlefront are you talking about? Are you talking about the old so, Battlefront 2 or the new Battlefront No, the newest. 2? The newest. I've not played the newest Battlefront, though. Okay. So I play both of them. But in the newest one, the Corvus is your ship, actually. Yeah, from the story, yeah. Yeah. And so it's just super cool. I love the attachments to that. That's why I like the Starhawk so much, because I played Squadrons. I got to fly around inside of it. Um, so how yeah. how cool is it that Armada, the game, made the Starhawk like initially as the first ever depiction of the ship, 
and then squadrons came out and used that same model it blew my mind i was i was on cloud nine when that was it happening. was so every time cool, they teased right? an image i was about it oh so good and then you got to because you played the game right i played squadrons yeah you got to fly inside of it and like be affected by the fucking tractor beam yeah that was like, super cool oh my gosh and then i uh, and I, I just think that the the lore for the Starhawk, you know, being made of uh, scrapped destroyers by the rebels, I think um, it's you so cool. You see that in its design; um, it's fantastic. I love. Well, it. Well, additionally, on the Corvus, the Raider didn't exist at all until they made it an X-wing. I had no idea. There was there was no ship called the Raider for the Empire until X-wing, the miniatures game, said we need an antithesis to the CR-90 for the Empire. Hmm. And then they made the Raider completely, like, alongside Lucasfilm. And then that was the ship we got, and that became the Corvus. I love that. I think that shit's so fucking cool. I love that so so much. Now, comparing the CIS with Empire... I want to highlight the squad difference. So for the CIS, the average squads were 34, I guess, 34 points. Mm -hmm. And for the Empire, it's 80. 80. Where do you think that's coming from? Well, uh, I think first and foremost, I mean, the commander number one is Sloan, right? Yeah. So I think that's obviously a huge effect. Um, if it's a Sloan commander, you're going to be using as many squadrons as you can. So I, I think that's where that's coming from, for sure. Do you have something different? You know what? I fucking don't. Like, once you said Sloan, I was like, <laughs> you know what? That makes sense. It makes sense <laughs> it would that be they have weird more if I didn't see that. <laughs> average squadrons if Sloan is one of the number one commanders from this, this team tournament. And honestly... Other than Grievous, there's no commander that benefits from Separatist squadrons at all. Like, they don't even interact with them at all. Fair. Uh, I also have to comment, uh, using 80 points of squads for Imperial is the only way to do anything effective with squads for Imperial. I, I just think that if you're taking... If you're making a fleet at all and you don't have any squadrons, I think that you're living in the past. And you need to kill it if you have to. No, I think you're living in a fantasy world where you don't want to spend six hours playing. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. I mean, <laughs> if, no, you, you probably won't even pl- be playing for an hour because your enemy that has a fucking huge bomber list of squadrons is just going to fucking skunk you. Oh, I know, but because y- you know I, I tend to not have squadrons, right? Like, you've played me a bunch. Yeah, you, you generally... I think the most I've seen you have with squadrons is like 70 points and that's only when i know i'm going against you (laughs) to be fair (laughs) so um, i think you would bring zero squadrons if you could i i did on my tournament right so um yeah i i think that i i think the squadron game is fun i think it makes the game last a long time and especially when i'm playing two games in a day at a tournament i need to you know stamina i think is something i have to think about too yeah um and yeah, so that's just kind of how I feel about the squads. Uh, I'm in it for the big ships, right? Yeah. I think the squads add flavor to that. I don't think that they're the main focus of the game for me. Um, so, you know, things like a Sloan build where, like, literally you're playing the squad game, it's not, it doesn't pique my interest, right? That's not where I find the most enjoyment from Armada. One of my hot takes with the squadrons is that I don't think there should be any squadron aces. I'm on board with this. That's my take. I think that makes sense. There should be none. The fact that, yep, one hundred percent. Or and they should be prohibitively expensive. If if there are, I would. I I don't think so. I think none. No squadron aces. At least get rid of scatter, Jesus. Well, I mean, all all of the all of the squadrons that have defense tokens, no, none. I think only the generics. They they do enough. They do enough. They're cheap. Just put them in your list. Have like, you know, eight 
16 squadrons, you know, however many you want. I think the issue is is that people want the unique characters. They like that flavor that you get. And you can't just have Luke's X-Wing squadron be the same as a regular Even with my hot take, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Just, Just overall, it's like, it just takes something away, I think. Especially with the I... scatter races. Fuck. <laughs> so I am on board with this. I just don't think anybody else is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, <laughs> if, if they came out with like a fucking 2.0 armada and they took away all of the fucking unique squadrons, I would be like... People would be what, so pissed. What the fuck are you doing, you know? like. Imagine all those unique things you painted. All those little tiny triangles. Nah, I'd still fucking use them, dude. I mean, of course you're still going to use them, but yeah. now they mean nothing. Now they mean nothing. That would <clears throat> that would fucking savage me. But but I don't um, I don't know. I think that they're too strong for their points, and they're they're just too evasive. You know, it's like it feels bad. I agree. Let's move on to rebels. Um, uh, I, one one thing I want to talk about uh, something I'm surprised to see on this list. Uh, veteran gunners. Veteran gunners. Yeah. Now, tell me what surprises you about this. I, mean, I think the card kind of sucks, isn't it? To reroll all dice? Yes, but and remember, so, like, only if remember you veteran whiff. gunners, you can spend the accuracies before you reroll. So if you get oh, one yeah. accuracy and you've got like more than you need, <clears throat> just reroll the whole fucking kit and caboodle. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I just I don't think that that's a good. Way, effective way to roll dice or spend points. Um, I'm not a fan of it in general. I think that I do- due to the amount of onagers that are on this list 24 out of 33 I don't think it's surprising that Veteran Gunners is a part of that because you use that alongside of Ordnance Experts you re-roll your whole set of red dice and black dice if you whiff on them and then you re-roll mm. with Ordnance Experts do you know what I think it is? Is they're using the red laser version of the Onager? They are. And 20, think, 24 yeah. of the 24 <laughs> Onagers. That, that's all they're taking. I don't think there's a single think, fucking Onager Star Destroyer. Uh, I, I think I agree with that. Um, but that being said, I think that the the veteran gunners lends itself better to that long range destroyer. Um, I am surprised that I don't see. I, don't, I forget what her name is. Is it Captain Brunson? The one that lets you retain the die at the start of the round and then Varnillion. swap it out? Varnillion, oh, like, who also came with the Onager. I'm surprised that I don't see her there with that veteran. She's guy. not good. They seem... Mm, mm, she's not good. I, I don't... No, no, she's good. No, she's real good. No, she's not. Here's the thing. She's like, I don't good. use her good, but... You don't use her at all. I've never seen yeah. you use her. So what are you talking yeah, about? but she's good. You don't even well, think she's I mean, good. Because I do other... Because... Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you don't even think she's good. You don't bring her. Uh, because I, I'm doing other things that aren't dice fixing at that level it's like but I think we're just that, not uh, compatible i'm just thinking of uh different things for my life you know it's like i don't have time <laughs> for farnillion it's because she's not, not you, good me. dude you don't even <laughs> think about bringing her let's move on to rebels okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh uh standouts let me think a gate uh, mm, that's not a standout do you think it's a standout 16 out of 36 i think it's a standout I, I think the most expected. used companion. What? You think? I think it's expected. Expected? Literally, I feel like I, everyone uses her. I I agree that like she's you. expected. Like if there was just a non-commander upgrade that said, "Add any fucking defense token that you want for twenty points," I take that every time. A non-scattered yep. defense token makes sense. It's like, yes, every single time. She would be 36 out of 36 if she wasn't a commander. That makes sense. Um, and she, so she interesting evades um, accuracies. It's like, obviously you take her so much. On, just put her on your big ship and don't fucking worry about it. I think she sense. is so undercosted for her value. So during the tournament, the Starhawk opponent actually had an evade on his Starhawk. Yeah. Um, and so I think that was pretty helpful, those first two rounds, you know, getting to uh, force me to 
I think re-roll those dice. So the issue was, is I was the same ship size, so he wasn't able to really capitalize on that major effect. What was his commander? Was, um, it, was it Krista, or did he just have the Amity title on the Starhawk? I think it was. Uh, I think it was Krista. Oh. Yeah. But I mean, Krista lets you choose what defense token you're taking. So, like, if he saw onagers, obviously he would take an evade. Yeah, he was saying that during the game that he wished he had chose a brace, though. Yeah. Because uh, I did have intel and shit. <laughs> yeah, the intel <laughs> office is really fucking up. <laughs> um, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, I, to be honest, everything that I see here is super expected. Squadron amount, um, you know, seeing the Akbar is still up there even after all this time. Akbar's amazing. Um, oh my god, so good. Yeah, I am. Kicking a shoulder, I don't see anything. Foresight, Jane is light. It, it it's all the good shit. Like it's all the good stuff. I don't know. Do you see anything out of the ordinary on this list? Not really. And I I don't think that even with the rapid reinforcements, I don't think rebels got shaken up that much. Mm. It's like now this is a uh, like the same flavor. Far intel. There's nothing that's like extremely skewed to being overpowered, even with Krista. It's 16 lists out of 36. So it's not that crazy. The, the, crazy, the, the most extreme is the CR90 Corvette A with TRC, mm-hmm. with it, which is 37 out of 36, which means one guy took two, or one guy took mm-hmm. four, you know. And it's not that, it's not that outrageous. No, because it's a super effective way to run that ship. They're good ships. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think rebels are are pretty normal. Nothing, nothing here screams to me that anything is being abused. And honestly, the same with Empire, leaving out the fucking onager ridiculousness, mm. which I think when people realize that that's just not as good as just taking an ISD at speed two or three, mm-hmm. you know, it's like. Every game you play with an onager and you lose because you took an onager, just think if you had an ISD and you just made it go faster than a speed one onager. Like, that's a different game. This is valid. This is valid. Um, Moving on to Grand Army of the Republic. So, Republic. What do you think about Republic? How many games against Republic have you played? Um, I think that I've played... If it wasn't for you, I would say I've played the Republic more than the CIS, but of course, you typically play CIS these days. I love CIS. I, I used to play Empire a lot, but like CIS just fucking took me over. Fair enough. Um, I think the Republic ships, they're prettier ships. Uh, they're more iconic. Like people know them more. They are the good guys. Yeah, I think um, so. Looking at the uh, graphic here, hmm. trying to think if anything stands out to me. Squads, one hundred and three points. That stands out for sure. For sure, but I, it stands out, but it does not surprise me. Like, stands out, but is expected. Before all of these ships got released, if someone told me. Hey man, Republic, the Republic faction is going to be squadron heavy. I would be like, yeah, they fucking should be. Mm hmm. Yeah. What is their bid? 3.2. I think that was the lowest that I've seen. Nope, 2.5 from CIS. Interesting. Yeah, okay. CIS generally don't care about the bid. Yeah, still uh, pretty low there. Deployment 6.3. 6.8 for Rebels. Still higher than CIS. And definitely higher than Imperial. So, kind of mid-tier for a lot of these things. Interesting. It seems to kind of just uh, be the one that's in the middle of everyone else. Yeah, Republic seems to be in the middle. And my thing with Republic is that they have the lowest floor of all of the factions but the highest ceiling. Mm. 
because they have so many upgrades and commanders that rely on the person playing them obviously remembering all of these triggers and activating them at the right time when they need to planning out the not just the first three turns but the whole fucking game and triggering them when necessary i mean if 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 someone is starting the game and they're like what faction should i get into i really loved republic i would be like maybe choose a different faction Hmm. because republic is honestly the most difficult to play and and be very technical so looking at this and actually i i do see something a little bit uh, surprising projection experts i don't think that surprises me at all you put projection Ooh. experts on um the pelta medical frigate and you take it every time mm-hmm. they got four engineering fair I, I have not personally played as the grand army of the republic i have here, played so. against republic a lot and man when they pop off you get fucking destroyed that makes sense i'm trying to think if i've ever beaten a republic army before i think i played richard and like it was like when it first came out so like you know things are still kind of being worked out yeah um yeah it's just Hmm. so much token management and officer management that like if if you are not on top of your game you just forget you forget your triggers you forget your officer abilities your commander abilities and and then you lose so two questions um do you think that going against a republic player that having the um uh, gar saxon and the other mandalorian fighter giving out those ray tokens may be interesting and useful gar saxon all right give me a i know we haven't talked about him in a long time give me a second gar saxon so he's for empire uh, yeah, he's the Mandalorian fighter ace. He gives out the raid token instead of a damage card, if I'm not mistaken. So he's all right. So it's Gar Saxon, or instead of Mandalorian damage. gauntlet fighter, which mm-hmm. is, and you cannot fight me on this, the worst squadron in the game. Yes, yes. Other than yes. the the generic jump master. Hmm. I. You know, points wise, I think that it, Gar, uh, that the Mandalorian fighter and Gar Saxon, just that ship in general, is the worst ship. You know, even what? worse I agree than. With you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the so, only saving grace is it has Rogue. So, uh, but so I Gar, think Gar right, Saxon, but. when an enemy squadron yeah. with intel or relay at distance one activates, it suffers one damage. Assault while attacking a ship, you may spend one die with an attack when, with a hit icon. If you do, the f- defender gains one raid token. That's the worst ability in the entire game. Rogue... But it gives a raid token. Yeah, no. It reaches out, and it gives you a raid token. See, listen. Let's say I'm attacking a CR-90. It has no shields and three damage cards. What do you do? Do you do damage, or do you do a raid? <sighs> yes. Yes. I get that, but you get to choose. So in that situation, you obviously do what makes sense. But let's, I mean, in a, in a fleet that has a lot of working mechanics, you need these tokens to be in the right spot at the right time. Giving out ray tokens really sucks. I want to bring up the game that we played with the three interdictors. When you were giving out those ray tokens, and I wasn't able to get the engineering stuff going the turn earlier like I wanted to, that was a big difference to that game. I um, follow your logic... But, and also, but, just not but to interrupt. having raid tokens Go ahead. doesn't prevent mm-hmm. taking tokens. So it actually does nothing to the Republic. But it does prevent you from using the command. The, the Republic can act independently of taking raid tokens. Okay. Because they, right. just, well, they just need there's tokens the crux, to, re- to refresh their officers. And they, they can do that independently of raid tokens. They don't need to clear the raid tokens to untap their their clone captains or anything like that so all right so all right that's that that's going to be irrelevant then i will find a purpose for gar saxon at some point i think gar saxon and the 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 gauntlet fighters are trash fair assault needs to be for crits not for hits like like if assault said 
you can spend your crit icons for a raid token. That would be infinitely better. Does it not have bomber? It doesn't have bomber, no. Okay, then that'll do it. Yeah, that makes sense. Because like let's let's see. For rebels, for Kanan, mm-hmm. he has a special ability. While attacking a ship, you can spend a die with a crit icon and they gain a raid. And he also has assault, so he can double assault. But like if assault just said spend a crit for a raid, that changes your hits from being either a hit or a raid to being your whiffs. Like, you spend a crit instead of a hit for a raid. Then he can actually do something more reliably, and then he'd be worth his fucking 23 points. His 23 points for a fucking single brace ace. Fucking bullshit. I'm really surprised that he did not get a points reduction when everyone else did, because no one uses this guy, and it's pretty well known that he's not that great. Well, I don't, I don't think any of the squadrons got point reductions. I think it was only the, the commanders that did. Well, but that's what I'm saying. It was still an opportunity to make those changes. Yeah. But yeah, so I think that was our discussion on, on these various fucking... Upgrades taken for, what, 112 lists in the 2022 team Invitational? Sounds pretty fun. I, I wish I was a little bit more into the uh, like the digital Armada scene. but mm. Yeah, I, I don't like the digital Armada scene. Like I think TTS and Vassal, that's not really what I'm playing the game for. I, I think Armada as like a video game, as like a Vassal and TTS, I think it's not very good. I also think that uh, those digital formats give you too much information, right? Like, I, I agree. Uh, they kind of give like projections of the the rages as like you're kind of moving ships, and you can kind of see it and plan it in a way that you can't actually do, or wouldn't necessarily think to do in real life. Yeah, I agree, um, and that matters. I agree. Dude. Um, yeah. So, uh, still very, very cool though. I'm excited to see any more that comes uh, from that, and anything Armada is always awesome. Yeah, I, I, I like seeing kind of like this general state of the game of what is taken the most and if that is kind of too extreme. I think a, a lot of the outliers are like Intel Officer, Ordnance Experts, LTT, and ComSnet. And obviously okay. the flotillas. For the for the main two factions, Empire and Rebel, like those are the standouts. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I think we kind of like touch on most of the things that stood out to me. Um, you what doesn't stand out? Fine, one final note. What? Thermal shields. Doesn't it? Uh, sorry. Let me rephrase. It's there. It's present. I'm not surprised. Yeah, Thermal Shield seems pretty good, but also pretty situational. Like, sometimes it's good, and other um, times it's like, fucking not. The way that you feel about LTT, and uh, how that should like be broken up, where the point uh, cost changed, I-, I feel that way about Thermal Shields. Or, <clears throat> to be just perhaps more widely available, um, you know... <clears throat> I feel a little bit like having it faction locked isn't so good. It is such a good card. It is such a good card. I I just think I know that you say it being faction locked is bad, but can you imagine an ISD Kuat running up to you with thermal shields? Or an SSD. Well, they would they would just <laughs> lock it. Well, it's already locked to medium or large ship only. Oh, is it? While also See, I don't have the opportunity locked. to read it, right? Because I don't even have it for my faction. Yeah. I think because Clone War ships are already at a disadvantage dice-wise mm-hmm. to the other um, Civil War era ships, that Clone War's uh, thermal shields make sense. It gives them a bit of an advantage defensive-wise because they just cannot compete offensively with dice. Okay. 
And uh, you know, it's, that's it's five points, medium large ship only, and defensive retrofit. So it's like, not even all of their large ships can take it. Only one of their large ships can take it, which is the Providence. And only one of their medium ships. So it's like... I don't know. I, I think it's fine. I think it has a huge opportunity cost. Mm-hmm. And anytime I've built a Providence list, it's taken ECMs over Thermal Shields every time. You, you said ECM over Thermal Shield? Yeah. Okay. No, that's... ECMs, I think, I think it's a, a fantastic card. I mean, but still, it's just there's so many times where, like, I'm about to make this awesome attack, and then you're like, oop thermal shields and then oh my god such a day changer yeah i i think the munificent is the ship that takes thermal shields use munificent star for it Mm -hmm. you put thermal shields on that watt tambor top 12 medical team it'll it'll never die it'll never die. it'll never die that's it you know i'm very surprised they didn't let small ships take that card that doesn't really make too much sense well have you heard about the hard cell battle refit that has a defensive retrofit? But I thought the card said medium, large only. Yeah, but you were saying how you're not surprised that small ships can't take it, and that's the reason. No, I am, I am surprised. I, I think they should. I don't think they should. I think if I have... I think they should. I think it... Look, I agree with you. If I can take five hard cell battle refits all with thermal shields, I would. <laughs> And I think that's the reason why it says medium or large ship only. Because the hard cells are fucking tuned up. They're so fucking good. I think they're the best small ship in the game, barring the CR90. Okay. And if, if you gave them thermal shields, they'd just be the, sh- the best ship in the game. I'd just run, run five of them at an ISD. And it, it wouldn't be able to do anything. I think you're right. right. Roll four dice against me, four blues. The max you can do is four damage. The average you can do is two. And I just evade, redirect, whatever the fuck. And I blow you up with infinity red <laughs> dice. It's like, once once you get into thermal shields on small ships, you just start entering fucking Toontown levels of ridiculousness. No, you got me there, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, all right, cool. I think that wraps up the Facebook tournament. Yeah. Kind of chat there. I'm uh, excited to move on to the next segment. Are you? Uh, well, yeah, I think it was really cool. I was a really big fan. Well, so. well let's let's introduce segment three, then. Mm-hmm. Go for it. I ain't the host, man. You're the host. You introduce the segment. All right. <laughs> All right, so uh, definitely uh, we're going to be speaking about the Obi Wan Kenobi Disney show. Um, very, very good, I thought. Chandler, how do you feel? Man, I hate that you introduced it that way. Because how, how shall I introduce it? Because you were like, I thought it was very good, and I thought that the Obi Wan Kenobi show sucked. Oh no! I didn't like it at all. Oh, okay. All right. So disclaimer: I have a very low bar. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, tell me what you didn't like, man. Mostly. Let me tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, like, I thought that the first two episodes were awesome. Oh, I thought the opposite. Okay. And then everything else, I was like. It felt like one of those old Star Wars books that was just like, you know, did you ever read those ones where they were like, this is the, you know, Han Solo cantina band stories, or this is the book that's focused on Bosk, you know, and you're just like, who signed off on this shit? No, you I know? didn't read that. I read like X-Wing and like... Uh, a little bit of the I Jedi series there. Yeah, that's kind of where I I stuck like, my nose like, for like the books. I've read and like the Thrawn book. I've read a lot of those fucking old books that mm-hmm. were just like, who the fuck <laughs> signed off on this side story? All right. Um, and every episode I watched of Kenobi, I was like, af- 
after like the initial intro of Kenobi being like super depressed and he's on Tatooine, he's watching Luke, I'm like, yeah, 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 I get this. This I vibe with. This is what should be mm-hmm. happening. Mm-hmm. Everything after that, once the Grand Inquisitor got fucking ganked by Reva, I was like, what the fuck is going on? How did that break the ball for you? Hold on. Well, that super, I mean, I'm not going to say like I expected it or anything like that, but they're fucking like Sith people. They're going to do weirdo shit like that. Because like, here's the question. Why did someone like the Grand Inquisitor get fucking ganked like a bitch? Because yeah, like, all right. because here's the thing. The Grand Inquisitor, to the other Inquisitors that have been established in the story, is like Vader to the other Inquisitors. So if... And follow me on this. Yeah. Let's say Vader was training a bunch of Sith acolytes on his own, you know, like Sith people do. And then in the show someone stabs vader in the chest and he falls down what do you think about that that shouldn't happen right okay sure so why the where are you going with this does the grand inquisitor just let this some random chick that's been introduced in i don't know she's been in one episode and she stabs him in the chest why does that happen all right, all right, hear me out, right? I'm hearing you. She, as a force user and as a uh, lightsaber user, okay. was stronger than him. Was stronger than him? Stronger than him. He, because uh, I'm pretty sure, like, when he came back, he didn't, like, go fuck her up. Darth Vader did all the hard work. I think that literally, and he, I think they mentioned this, like, she's just, to them, low born, uh, and they kind of feel like, higher class than her not necessarily that you know they're stronger they're just better so you just think that he wasn't even considering being stabbed by her as an option uh yeah and i don't think that there was anything that he could have done about it because again i think that like she's just a stronger like force user period um he just literally thought like i'm a higher rank i don't i don't know it's just kind of like the case of like an officer like ordering around someone that can clearly kick their ass like it's not a matter of um you just don't expect that to happen i don't know how to explain this i i see your point but i think i disagree with it like this is a military arrangement right like like you don't expect your subordinate to fucking shoot you in the chest it just happens i think (laughs) i would agree with that if they didn't completely explain that she was just some youngling in the jedi temple and that they found her, and I quote, in the gutter, which seems kind of rude to say about somebody. That's what, yeah, that's what he was trying to say. Is like you're like low, lower than us, like a lower class. Yeah, but that matters because the Grand Inquisitor was an actual Jedi Temple guard. Mm-hmm. So like, why did she stab him in the fucking chest? Like, just block that dude. It. Like, when that happened, I was completely removed from the moment. And I texted my brother, and I was like, why? He's not dead, though. So why are they pretending like he's dead? Because I know he's not dead. Because he's in the Rebels show. So what the fuck is going on? I think that she, like, really just grabbed the bull by the balls and just said, like, fuck you, take a saber to the chest, I'm in charge now, Vader, look what I did, okay, I have the pin that says I'm actually in charge. He was off getting some back to somewhere. Um, <laughs> and I think that, like, that was it. Like, I think that, like, it it is a military structure. I think that she went outside of that structure, but then folded back into it at a higher rank. Um, she went outside of it by trying to murder that guy. But they're Sith, so it's okay. <laughs> I think it's weird that they were so outraged by her outbursts. Like, so much of the first couple episodes were the Inquisitors pulling her aside and being like, 
you're too off you're a little the piece chain. of shit like you're you're fucking you're too outrageous you know it's like yeah i watched these guys in rebels and they were like fucking cutting people up like meat you know like why are they I think all it just upset? shows they were scared of her i think that she was significantly stronger than they were damn i hate that yeah. this argument is very convincing uh, i know and it's just because i like it so much like i think about it all the time I right, so I I see these things that you see, and I have to justify them for myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I um, I would have liked them emphasizing that the Inquisitors didn't like how strong she was, over how aggressive she was about attacking these random people. You know, I don't know why when Riva cut off this old bitch's hand that they were like. You're going Whoa. out of line, you know? Yeah. It's like, that, when they did that, I, I was, was like, what the fuck am I watching? Like, these are all Sith red lightsaber people. Like, why are you getting, <laughs> getting upset about her cutting some bitch's arm off? Like, I didn't even yeah, feel was... anything when she did that. I agree. Um, that was out of character. I think that that could have used a little bit more thinking. It was fucking weird. Especially it was weird. when they were using established characters like the Grand Inquisitor... And the, Who's an fifth, asshole. and the fifth brother who in my mind after watching all of the scenes of them I mean like I'm a junkie of Star Wars I, I've watched mm-hmm. them I know how they act and then they're like yo Riva you're being kind of outrageous here and I'm like <laughs> what like you're Coolest. like the fifth brother is a literal like shark person Yep. And that's his whole yep. vibe. So, like, why is he being like a little bitch about Reva cutting some old lady's arm off? Didn't even kill her. Like, like I don't, I don't get that. I don't feel that. But that's fair. That, I, I think that broke the 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 universe a little bit. Yeah, that broke the I, universe. I, I, was, I was just three, like, what's happening? What we expect. And then the guy that got to play the Grand Inquisitor, I feel like mm-hmm. they found him at like a Seven Eleven. And just put him in makeup and was like, "You're this guy now." I love it. And though. he just he it's just like so rocks, good. and his like shoulders are like all slumped. Hello. And he's just like, "Hello." <laughs> I'm the Grand Inquisitor, and I was like, "Dude, be more intimidating." You're 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 walking at me like some dude who like frequents Seven Eleven, and I, I don't I don't feel it. I don't feel like you have the presence at all. Of the character you're supposed to be portraying, oh, so you know. Um, do you, slightly off topic. Did you watch the movie Don't Look Up? Don't look up. What? Yeah, on Netflix. Did you watch that movie? No, I haven't watched I know that. I'll bring it around. Uh, okay. Well, there's a character. Uh, he's like kind of portrays uh like the Apple founder guy, Steve Jobs or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the way that he acts is exactly like the Grand Inquisitor. Just super awkward. Like, not in touch with what's going on. I love it. Anyways. Uh, yeah, super like, great. Like, every that. time I saw the Grand Inquisitor, I was like, "Why do I feel like they just picked you up? Like you're you're like an extra that got put in makeup, <laughs> it's and so you good. feel like you you yourself don't feel like you should be there. Like it was so awkward. <laughs> like when Vader stabbed Riva at the like the finale, and he was like, "I knew you were you all along." And the Grand Inquisitor <laughs> walked up and he was like, Hello! <laughs> Rage does wonders for the body. And then turns around. I'm like, what's happening here? Like, Oh, that's fantastic. It was fucking weird. Why'd you get stabbed at all? I oh, feel man. like the show would have been way better if Reva wasn't a character and it was just the Grand Inquisitor trying to find Kenobi like why couldn't that be it and I know why it couldn't be it is because the guy they got to play the Grand Inquisitor was awkward as fuck <laughs> so they went up to like the uh, <laughs> basically the, whoever the actress is that plays Reva was like hey you're upgraded you're upgraded like you can act better than this fucking weirdo homeless guy we found at the 7-Eleven. And Oof. there you go. Now, I know I said I didn't like Kenobi. But, like, a lot of what I didn't like was 
first off, how it felt like a weird side book, like Han Solo and the Cantina stories, where it's like, mm-hmm. I'm watching this, and I'm like, okay, someone said you could make a story about Kenobi and Vader and the Inquisitors, but nothing can actually happen. The universe can't change. Nothing can change. Mm -hmm. Don't directly reference anything. Obi-Wan has to be on Tatooine, obviously. But that also means you have to start your story on Tatooine. I need to interrupt. Interrupt. I think I think that Kenobi changed so much for me about Star Wars. Dude. I think that it has Fucking go- tell me. Yeah, I mean I will get there. Um okay, so I, you know, I was gonna kinda do this like chronologically with the episodes, but um I'm not going to do that now. So first and foremost, um up until this point, did Leia and Obi Wan ever meet? The answer to that would have been no, am I right? You would be right. So I feel like them seeing each other means so much more. Um, and I think that it makes sense in the way that they... Because uh, hmm, they didn't like physically meet. They kind of came to rescue. Luke said, like, hey, I like we, ca- we came with Obi-Wan, but then Obi-Wan dies before Leia gets onto the Falcon. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's how that goes, right? Yes. Um, so it kind of just... It, it, it makes you think of the conversation that we never got to see of them reuni- reuniting and what that would have been like. Mm-hmm. And I think that would have been, I think that would have been, I don't know. It just, it adds so much. Um, you know, another thing just to touch on that it adds is, uh, on Peru and uncle Owen, right? On Peru is such a badass now, right? She fucking like grabs a fucking laser, tells the dude to go do his shit. Um, you know, uncle Owen just like standing there, not saying shit, even though like Kenobi is right there and could give him up. You know, it adds so much backstory to these other characters. And so when you watch episode four and you see them burning, like, you know that they put up this huge fight, right? That's probably why the Empire went out of their way to fucking incinerate them. It's probably because they were shooting back. Um, I think... I don't know. Everything you just said, I agree with. Thank you. The, it, it the adds initial so much. two episodes, like the first two episodes of Kenobi, I thought were so good. Everything with Owen and the Inquisitors, where he was like, cut me, bitch. I'll say <laughs> nothing. You know? And the Inquisitors are trying to find this rogue Jedi and everything. I thought that was the strongest part of the whole show. Mm-hmm. Like, if they showed those two episodes and it was like, we're done, I would have been like, alright, that's great. I got like, okay. I got like fucking an hour, 40 minutes of extra Star Wars, you know? I, I feel like well, everything it, it goes after fo- that, it goes on though it goes on but like it goes on but it doesn't add anything to those okay first okay two let's episodes. talk about what it adds what uh, is that well first we have we have Obi Wan's kind of character growth right like he was this depressed old man like that other dude like came to him for help and ended up being hung right because he didn't do anything yeah um, you know that shows something uh, you see him building. Th- the trust when he because there's like the guy that was pretending to be a jedi and then he thought that he was faking them out but it turns out that they weren't i like and that. then you have the like yeah i thought that was really cool uh and then you know the big one uh the elephant in the room like the final conversation uh with anakin and obi-wan there i think that if nothing else i didn't like anything oh, about i didn't like anything about the final confrontation with obi-wan and vader so let's talk about the symbology right so first things first hits the uh hits the helmet exposes the other side of the face i'm gonna stop you um, there go ahead i was watching this and when obi-wan did that to vader it completely took me out of the whole episode <sighs> because i've already it, impo- it had I've, to happen i've already fucking seen that in rebels but it i've already it seen this happen. whole fucking scene Okay, okay. It felt like lazy and it didn't impact with me at all. Do you know why it's not that. lazy specifically? Tell me. Um, because when you see a slightly uh, helmetless Vader in like some of the earlier stuff, he's got like kind of a smoother, nicer head. 
um and then when you see him obviously like uh, i think episode five he's got like that that gash that's where obi-wan hit him i believe in this most recent battle that's the, specifically the scar from his fight with obi-wan uh, i don't agree with that i think okay. that's uh, that's just scarring from episode three which i think they were pretty accurate on depicting on what i think the, it was different the, i have to look it up yeah i i, I think that's pretty debatable i i okay, see where you're coming but, from though but i don't still i didn't like that is, entire but... like last episode i just didn't like it was obi-wan fighting vader again for some reason on this random planet and the whole scene where i don't know if you remember you probably remember where obi-wan just spread out his arms and all these and the rocks. all these rocks just started pummeling vader and i was watching this scene and it was so dark not dark as in like a mood wise but just visually was so not bright that I was like, what am, what am I watching? It was a dark moment, though. It, not dark, like, mood-wise. I mean, like... I know, but they're not going to have, like, these bright, like, you know, like, uh, Harry Potter air lights, you know, whatever they call this. I things. understand what you're saying, but, like, I want to see what I'm watching. And Obi-Wan just throwing his arms out and having all these rocks fly by him reminds me so much of the last jedi's like ending scene where ray just pushes her arm out and these rocks just lift up it feels so discontingent from anything i've ever seen before you know what i mean perhaps because those are the two most powerful first uh force users we've seen not, well not not powerful. Nah, that's not true like but when I think Obi Wan reaches a different level when that happens, and I think Ray reaches a different level when that happens. I disagree. With you know, that fundamentally. I think mm, no. Hold on, because like Star Wars really likes to use the rocks to show how powerful its people are. When Luke is sitting there meditating, he's like trying to float just those few rocks, right? And so then when you see Ray effortlessly do like the whole like fucking landslide, I think that it's spe- specifically showing you something with that. I will quote. Luke Skywalker here. Everything you said about the Force is wrong. It's not about lifting rocks. It's about resistance. When Luke throws his lightsaber away and says, I will not strike down my father, I am a Jedi like my father in front of the Emperor. That is the eminent moment in which he shows what a Jedi is. It's not about lifting rocks. It's about resistance to the dark side and saying, I will stand against you. It's not about throwing your arms to the side and throwing a bunch of fucking rocks at the person you call the brother to destroy them and escape. So, but what ha- you're proving my Chandler? So, but what happens? I, even after all that, it's not about killing Vader, because he could have. It's about him walking away and not doing it. Yes, I. It still I, has to I visually show us. I agree with you. There. It has to show us that he's capable, though. Mm-hmm. I think he could have just walked away and not thrown all those fucking rock. Like when he did the rock thing, and he spread his arms out and he th- threw all like seventy-five fucking rocks. He could have. It just could have skipped that, and he could have just walked away after showing but Vader he just defeated. Caught up Vader. to him and kicked his ass, but he didn't defeat him yet. He ki- for rocks. No, he for sure kicked his ass. He for sure kicked Vader's ass, and then threw a bunch of rocks at him for no reason, and then walked away. He could have just fucking walked away. I think that scene would have been better emphasized with him defeating Vader in single combat again, like he did in Revenge of the Sith. And just mm. walking away and not killing him again, then throwing a bunch of fucking boulders at him, and then running away, you know, it just felt off. It didn't, it didn't vibe with me. I I disliked that moment 
in the same way I disliked Rey lifting the rocks at the end of The Last Jedi. I think that... I have to concede here. I think that you bring up really good points. I think if Obi-Wan, like, like he struck him in the back, and Vader said, you didn't kill Anakin, I did. I love that, that was amazing. That was so good. I think good. that that sums up so much. Um, and then, uh, you know, something I read on the internet, it really... Uh, go, go ahead. It emphasized Vader's own suffering, his own hatred for himself. And when Obi-Wan threw all the rocks in him, it was unnecessary at that point. Like, everything that needed to be said was said. And Obi-Wan could have just turned around and walked away. And then you do that scene where Vader screams, Obi-Wan! It's perfect. <laughs> like, why did that the rock throwing need to be in there? Perhaps because Vader could have still pursued him. Like, he, had, he was really motivated, right? So, like, I feel like he has to be really fucked up to not continue going after Obi-Wan, even to his death. So I kind of have to... I, I might want to rewatch it a little bit and see, like, how incapacitated was Vader before this rock-throwing incident? Yeah. Because that's probably, you know, what it is. And if I, I remember, like, kind of Vader, like, dodging the first few rocks, so he was still very well and able before the ones that he couldn't dodge made him not. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, I definitely think that, going back to what you said, they could have just done it better by, like, having him be fucked up in the combat and just not needing that in general. Um like was it necessary no could they have done something better yes I, yeah but i think if that's at this point i don't i don't want to hear about any kind of story that doesn't contribute at all like don't spend your money on it don't mm, spend my but we're time not in the same boat then you're not oh you're not in the same boat as me tell me and see that might be the fundamental thing is i'm just happy for the content like, what we saw was dope. They told us more about characters that we didn't know about. Like I said, the Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru thing. Um, you know, we kind of showed us... Because, like, we all knew in the back of our minds, like, obviously Obi-Wan, like, had this, like... He must have had this struggle. Like, what did he do for this time? And it just gave us that information. And we didn't need anything to change. Like, yeah, they laid it all out for us. But in my mind now, these characters are changed. They're different. And it enhances, I think, what comes after like you know when i see aunt Peru and uncle owen burning it's now no longer the potentially verbally abusive uncle owen that i saw telling luke that he can't go to fucking whatever academy it's uncle owen that stood up to that inquisitor and said you know i'm not telling you shit go ahead and kill me you know what i, what I mean like that's what i got out of this and i think that that's great damn <laughs> 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 So yeah, I don't know. Uh, you you make you make a good point. Thank you. I think Thank you. that of the six episodes we got, it could have been four, and it would have been better yeah. if Riva was just the Grand Inquisitor hunting mm -hmm. Obi Wan, and I I just thought it was weird. Riva got fucking stabbed by vader didn't die went all the way to tatooine to kill luke but didn't kill luke she just took him to the canyon and then carried him back i think that reva should have like her arc should have stopped at her getting stabbed <clears throat> i think that she should have died i think she should have uh, died think as well yeah I, uh, I think that the stuff with Luke, I thought it was really weird, and I wouldn't have done it. You know, if I had to say, you know, what it was, is you, when you were giving me that really good spiel about, you know, what the Force is, is saying to the Emperor, no, I'm not going to kill my father. I, I, think I think that, that, that is that, the embodiment that, of what the Force is. And by that logic, I think that what Reva did is the embodiment of what the Force is, and 
they probably just wanted to get the character redemption. Oh, how dare you use my own powers against me? You, th- <laughs> you think that Riva at the end saying, no, I won't kill Luke Skywalker is what? Because she could have done it. That would have been it. Everything else would have been meaningless. I think that if that is to be true, the writers should have given her a better line than I failed them. Yes, I 100% agree. Okay, well then we're on the same page. Yeah. I think that if they gave her a better line, that it would have been fine. It's like, I see what they did, and I see what they were doing with it. Um, I think that the execution was not where it should have been for something so important. Also, like, like the pivotal, I was watching, yeah. and I think in like episode four or five, the editing of the of the video took me out of it. Mm-hmm. Like... Mm-hmm. Do you remember when they were getting chased by the Star Destroyer? Mm Obi-Wan had already saved Leia. They were on... Mm -hmm. um, The transport ship. The transport ship. And... Obi-Wan had already committed to getting in the escape pod and going to the other planet. And he told Leia, I'm sorry, I can't, like, continue this journey with you. And then he walked away into like what I assumed was the escape pod and then in like the very next scene he comes out and talks to Leia again and yeah. and then goes to the escape pod and I'm like wait what I thought he was going now like why is he having another scene with Leia that should have happened before him deciding to go it, it just felt um, a lot... It, it, it felt disjointed to me. Do you know? I'm trying to think. I feel like... I'm trying to think if there's any way to justify that. And I think that that is a very I don't, weird way to do it. It was weird, right? But, like, you have to ask ourselves, like, what, what point were the writers trying to make when, with that scene? I think they and were the trying to thing, have go a, ahead. a touching moment with Obi-Wan and Leia. Which... Mm-hmm. To be fair, they've already done. Yeah. So then let's ask ourselves, like, what, what what would be the purpose of doing that again? And the only thing I can think of is, you know, perhaps, like, when Obi-Wan said goodbye the first time, it was for the wrong reasons. From, like, a Jedi perspective. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. Right? And I'm really grasping at straws here. I would have to, like, specifically watch and see, like, this sequence of events because I truly don't remember it. Um, but yeah, I I haven't rewatched any of the episodes of Kenobi, and all of I don't feel the need to. All of my explanations are just the strong feelings I got from watching it initially, mm. and like yeah, that's sufficient. Even though, like, listen, anybody who's watching, even though I'm having these super strong opinions about Kenobi, I still think it's like a six or a seven out of ten of a show rightfully so which which for me is like really good <laughs> really good as a, as a show overall but like even with um what what is that one chick's name tala what was her character she was that um empire officer that just randomly showed oh, up super dope in episode yeah. three i mm. hate that so Ooh. much why it was it was presented to me in the Bad Batch season one. Have you watched Bad Batch? I have. We're gonna have to talk about Bad Batch because should, yeah, that should be for the next one. Um, what was presented to me in the Bad Batch was that also in Solo. Also in Solo was that why is the Empire so bad for normal people? Why is it so bad? Like, you, I, I know... Where, where are you coming from? I know from Disney's perspective that they know that the Empire was based on World War II Nazis. Obviously. Yes. So yeah. none of the characters they create can actually be bad that aren't complete villains like Darth Vader or the Grand Inquisitor. So Riva has to see the light at the end of Kenobi. Tala, the person who was working for the Empire, 
has to have already known that the Empire was bad. But my favorite well, character... She says that she joined, and then she got asked to do some shit, was kind of lied to about what it was that she had to do, and then realized what was happening. Okay, start from the beginning, then. So. What was my point? I don't know. That's where I was trying to get to. All right. Maybe I'll leave Nazis out of out of the fucking podcast. <laughs> I think so, so. so Tala, I think we were talking about like Disney and like yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna tie Tala from uh-huh. Kenobi, the TV show, to the Bad Batch, which I really, really liked. I really loved the Bad Batch. It was a bit. Yeah, it, it just. It was a bit long in the tooth. Mm-hmm. There was there was a bunch of filler episodes that didn't need to be there, but Tala was introduced as an Empire character who had already determined that the Empire was bad for some reason. And when um, when I was watching Bad Badge, the character Crosshair betrayed his whole fucking brother group. Because he realized that the Empire and all, all of their military might, like, that was the side to be on if you wanted to survive. Mm-hmm. And even at the end of Bad Batch, when he was like, my, my control chip has been removed for a while, mm-hmm. this is my choice. Mm-hmm. Even at the end, when they were destroying their home of Kamino, he was like, I still choose the Empire. Mm-hmm. That's where I want to go. Like, why is choosing the Empire so bad? Oh, okay. Do you know what I yeah, mean? I know that's. I mean, that's a really interesting question, and it, it, it's really just because probably the xenophobia. Like, that's not good. I mean, <laughs> like, yes, obviously that that is no good for sure. Um, I mean, like, from and, like, from just a personal perspective, when you see someone show up to your planet with, like, four Star Destroyers, and you're like, oh, they're called Star Destroyers. They completely destroy solar systems. Like, maybe <laughs> we should be on their side. Mm-hmm. Is that the worst thing to think? It just depends what you're doing with that. Like, I mean, obviously, like, are they enslaving your populace? Like the, like the Twi'leks? Like... If you're a Twi'lek, yeah, that's a really de- bad thing to have pop up in your system. This this is another thing. You bring up the Twi'leks, and I, I just feel the vibes. You've watched Rebels, right? Yeah, I've watched. You Rebels. have watched Rebels, okay? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I didn't catch it. So you've watched Rebels, and you've watched the Bad mm-hmm. Batch. So, why is it every time, even with the Clone Wars, when we go to Ryloth? It's the fucking best part of the show. Hmm. It's the best, right? Clone Wars Ryloth is the best. The several times we've been there. Rebels when you go to Ryloth is the best. Bad Batch when you go to Ryloth is the best. I think those are just really good story arcs. And then you have the ability to have the whole, like, jihad situation that they're doing. (laughs) <laughs> they, 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 so, they do do a little bit of jihad in, in Rebels, to be fair. But and, yeah, what I, I determined think... is that Ryloth is the standard of the galaxy's state. Hmm. So every time we go to Ryloth, it is kind of like a refresher document of what's going on with the rest of the galaxy. So all of the arm stealing, all of the resistance, all of that can be put on Ryloth because they're an oppressed people just like everywhere else. Hmm. That's interesting. That's a really fresh perspective. So anytime we go to Ryloth, it's always really good, <laughs> is what I'm saying. Um, hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the arcs are awesome, too. No, I agree with that. Yeah, I, but... To come back to it, I didn't like Kenobi that much. I think it was like a mm-hmm. six for me. I think that like some of the the writing was weird. 
like I know that the Uncle Owen and Baru like screen time was good, but them like taking arms against an inquis an inquisitor was like weird for me, you know? It's like mm-hmm. an injured one to be fair. They they should be fucking almost killed immediately, right? She did just got uh, get uh, shanked by Vader, so yeah. But like, she should have fucking died from that. Like, if, she should if, have. If she died from that, and then the Grand Inquisitor found the fucking message, like, and mm-hmm. then he went to Tatooine, like that would be cool. Yeah, but then Luke would have been dead. <laughs> That's fair though. He, yeah, he would can't have that happen. Dead. He would just fucking <laughs> stab him. Um. So so you added uh, a little note. Qui-Gon also reveals himself to Obi-Wan for what I believe oh, yeah. is the first time. I think that's true. I do as well. I do as well. Uh, so I think that's... I don't know. Again, it just adds more to the story, so you know that the entire time that Obi-Wan has been there, he was uh, communing with Qui-Gon. That's one of those things that I think about, and I don't think it adds anything to the story. Uh, it adds to my head canon, which is, I think, good. <laughs> and then who knows? There might be a season two. <laughs> Dude, uh, man, I love that that line that you just made. I might th- get that what? tattooed on my lower back. That adds to my <laughs> head canon, which I think is good. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I live for. Dude, that's great. Because, like, when, when Qui-Gon showed up at the last part of the show I was like and then what end fucking end it just ends after that Finn yeah and there's nothing that happens it's like fuck it's it, it's what happens in your head and again you know there might be a season two and it just it opens things up like books you know comic is books is there gonna like be that. a season two I don't think that at all mm-hmm. me either but I hope it um yeah I think it adds yeah. Over, but, overall, I, I was down on Kenobi. I thought the first two episodes were str- really strong, and the rest of the fucking show was not good at all. I'm on the flip side of that. I think that it started off really weak, especially with, like, Leia, the Leia character, and, like, running away from Obi-Wan. Like, you're in a strange world, and you're a small child. You're totally going to hang out with the person that said they're going to rescue you. Uh, I don't know. So I didn't like all that. Um... But I think it got stronger at the end, and I think especially the last two episodes were off the wall for me. You know what? That's fair. I, I think we so. just have different opinions on, on how the show hit for us, mm-hmm. and I think that's fine. I think it's good, actually. Yeah. I think so. Reva was a weird addition to like an already plethora of characters in that time period. Uh... I don't think it was necessary, but I think that they needed a throwaway character. I mean, throwaway. But then that begs the question: away, like, why even in- include? Um, but they're not going to use her again, right? Like, she's not going to show up in anything else. She had her arc. She's redeemed. Maybe, maybe she's going to kind of like live her life, I guess, being super depressed about the things she did. <laughs> I mean, maybe that would be fucking funny yeah. if they just had like. A season of her being depressed as fuck, but like God, no. I, I think uh-huh. they should have killed her. But yeah, I think I think she should have died at the end, like at the very end, been like, no, like I fucking will not kill Luke Skywalker, the son of the person I hate the most, who tried to kill me and killed all my friends, and she should have just fucking died there at at like episode six, you know. Do you know what would have been interesting? Huh. If at the end, to kind of replace that choice that has to be made, uh, like if Reva died, uh, maybe it, Obi-Wan had to make the choice of, you know, going back to Tatooine to watch Luke or t- uh, potentially finishing off Vader. Huh? Uh, so we had mentioned how choice is really important and, like, showing that was important. Yeah. Uh, Reva did that by making the choice to not kill Luke. So we obviously need to replace that with some kind of equally weighted choice. I wonder what they could have done is uh, have something where maybe uh, Obi-Wan chooses, instead of finishing off Vader, to go back to Tatooine to watch Luke. 
Like he has yeah. the opportunity to just I, kill. Vader. I think that would have been a really great choice. Like while he's dueling with Vader, he chooses mm-hmm. not to completely destroy Vader and go exactly. back to Tatooine and save Luke. That Which should have right been choice, emphasized Vader saves more. The day. I think. One hundred percent. So yeah, lots of different things. Yeah, that. But yeah, I I, I think that the show was probably not as as good as it could have been but you're working in a time period where you can't do anything you can't change it you can't change you can anything just... you can't make any significant story additions you know it's... if you can only add irrelevant things how relevant can you possibly make what you're doing exactly so, and and i think they did a good job with what they had yeah i i think if you're given that choice is like you're working in this time period. You can only make things as relevant as you can make them. Like, if I were in that position, I would make another character and have them go through the story like they did with Reva. Absolutely. But I just think that it's just... Um, that's just a product of rushed bullshit. Uh-huh. They did have to cram a lot into six episodes as well. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm ready to move on to the next segment, if you are. That was our last segment. (laughs) All right. Hello, hello. I'm fucking back. Welcome. Halfway done with my whiskey, so... Oh, nice. I... Have smoked a lot of weed. <laughs> nice. I, I agree. It's a good day. It is. A um, good and day. then we also, yeah, we also have an addition to the podcast. Hopefully, she's not going to be loud. So. Oh, the, a sweet baby cat. Oh yeah, yeah. She's a, uh, one of the vocal ones too. So. Oh, you have multiple good cats. Good stuff. I have three cats. You have three cats. Oh I have three God. fucking. Cats. I've got one yeah. cat, and it is this one cat like fucking on my patience. Fair. Is your cat uh, male or female? female? I don't remember. I-, I think that's what it is, is my two male cats are super fucking chill, but this one's a lady, and my god. <laughs> it's fucking crazy. It's- and I've got, like, she's a Torby. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's just, like, the breed, but she always fucking wants to talk to me. Yep. Like, literally will meow multiple sentences at me. Mm-hmm. And I don't speak cat. So I don't know what the <laughs> fuck she's talking about. That's fucking annoying. Yeah. Uh, mine doesn't do full sentences, but she, she does like to...